Hey everybody, it's Dr. Tom Moorcroft here, uh, hanging out with my buddy, Dr. Darren Engels. We're gonna get him added in here. Good to see you there. We see a couple people I don't see on there yet. Darren, there you go. All right, perfect. All right. Thanks everybody for uh, joining us for, um, you know, Lyme Disease Awareness Month. It's coming to an end, but uh, Darren and I wanted to have a conversation. Uh, lots of questions have been coming up over the uh, course of the month, and we just wanted an opportunity to um, sort of be here to answer any questions you have. So, Darren, how's it going, man? Oh, good. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my Instagram situation here, and I think now we're good to go. Awesome. All right. Sounds Perfect. good to me. Good. Well, I know we've both been getting a lot of questions with Lyme Awareness Month that we want to help answer for everybody. And we've got a lot of different topics we want to cover. So I think the first thing that we probably want to cover, because uh, I know we both got a lot of questions on our, our Instagram and Facebook pages, is about biofilm. Oh, yeah. And I'm getting a little, I'm getting a little extra here. So I'm going to just change the volume just a smidge so that um, I can hear everything just right. So just bear with me one second. I think we're in good shape, though. I think we're in good shape now. Yeah, I don't hear the echo. All right, we're good. Perfect. All right. So I hope everybody can uh, hear us here. If you can't, let us know. Um, we're always trying to do multiple tech things and reach out to everybody on whatever platform uh, so that we can do this. But uh, yeah. So um, what's your what's your take on biofilms and Lyme and other things? And what questions have been coming up on on uh, you know your your sites? Well, I think some of the biggest questions that we've run across with biofilm is you know, what's really the best way to approach it? Because people are doing so many different things. And then we hear a lot about these, these negative reactions and like Herxheimer reactions when people start busting up the biofilm. So I think it'd be really great if we could kind of talk through you know, what's the best way to treat biofilm. And if people start to have negative reactions, you know, how can we walk people through that? Because I think it's important that people take something to break up the biofilm, but we don't want to be so aggressive with it that it starts to have a negative impact. And then people just feel you know, worse after the fact. So uh, do you want to talk a little bit about your approach to it? And then I'll chime in with mine. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of it's cool to me because, I mean, I always try to explain to people, you know, what we know about biofilm and what we don't know. And, you know, it's it's essentially like a whole bunch of organisms getting together to kind of hang out and protect themselves. And um, one of the primary components of a biofilm is fat, yeah. um, which is protective, you know, as well as a bunch of other substances. And one of the things um, that I've read is different biofilms, you know, can require anywhere from 200 to over 500 times the normal antibiotic dose to penetrate it. So right. if we're, if we're going to be doing something like, you know, say doxycycline as an antibiotic treatment, you can't take two or 500 pills twice a day. It's just not possible. So that's why we have to do these kind of other things, right? right. And so um, one of the things I do is I use a fair amount of liposomal artemisinin, which is basically mm -hmm. fat-bound um, artemisia. Some people know it as sweet Annie. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's an anti-babesia, anti-malarial herb. But in here, we try to put it in with some fat. Um, phospholipids and EDTA kind of to make a Trojan horse and help break it down. Right. You know, some of the other things that, uh, you know, I, I look at using um, could be systemic enzymes. People use natto kinase, serapeptidase and lumbrokinase. And we feel that might be helpful. Um, certainly we had a conversation the other day talking about potential use um, of things like monolaurin. Right. right. Um, yeah, because monolaurin has been shown to work. And um, at least, you know, the problem with any of these things, Darren, is that like we're talking about a like a Petri dish study. I mean, right. there's nothing really done in a mammal, so we don't really know. But the bottom line is monolaurin helps with candida. It helps with Yersinia. It helps with Borrelia, at least in Petri dishes. Right. Um, I do use a fair amount of biocidin also because, you know, in its liposomal form, because it's been shown to go after that. Um, there are certainly some others, but um, what are the ones that you're finding and what are you using? So you mentioned earlier the lumbrokinase. I actually like it a lot. Uh, lumbrokinase, if you look at most of the research, it's actually on cardiovascular disease. So, mm -hmm. you know, the implication is a little bit different. But when you look at it compared to natokinase, the research shows it's 10 to 12 times more potent than natokinase. So right. based on what it does as a fibrinolytic agent or its ability to break down clots in the body, you know, we can sort of extrapolate that it probably does the same thing for biofilm. 
So I think it's really effective, but I think the downside is that it's expensive. Super. So, you know, a <laughs> bottle of the you know, Ace can run 100 to $120, depending on the manufacturer. So mm -hmm. it can be cost prohibitive for people. So, you know, where cost is an issue, which for most Lyme patients is, uh, I think serapeptase is a better option oh, yeah. just because, you know, there are products that mix serapeptase with EDTA. Again, they're very effective at breaking down biofilm. And I think it's reasonably, reasonably priced. Uh, I also like NAC, N-acetylcysteine, which is an amino acid. NAC is a precursor to glutathione, but you also mm -hmm. get the biofilm breaking effect. People need to be aware that if you're going to use NAC to break down biofilm, long-term use will actually deplete zinc. So you need to make sure that you're supplementing with zinc if you've been taking NAC probably longer than maybe a couple of months or so. Uh, lactoferrin, okay. I've used minimally. Again, I think it's really good at breaking down biofilm, but because it's from a dairy source, and so many people do have a dairy allergy or sensitivity, that tends to be a bit problematic. So. Um, if you've got a dairy issue, you're probably not going to want to use lactoferrin, but if you do tolerate dairy, it can be pretty effective at breaking down biofilm. Uh, the other one I know that I get a question a lot, I personally don't use a lot of it for a lot of reasons, but people are talking about stevia, right, uh, right. On, you know, Dr. Shafi's work uh, for breaking down biofilm. What do you think about stevia? Well, I mean, I think the uh, same thing. I mean, I've seen the studies on it and again, it's just a small study. Um, I, I you know, I try it sometimes. I haven't really seen like some super spectacular, you know, benefits to it at the moment. Um, again, it's one of these things that it's been used as an antimicrobial for an extremely long period of time through human history. Right. Um, I don't think there's any massive downsides to it, but at the same time, I don't know that I, I'm like, wow, is the best biofilm buster ever. Right. Um, but I would like it to be for sure. <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah. You know, my concern with stevia is that it is a sugar, and most carbohydrates are metabolized in the very first part of your small intestine. So mm -hmm. the likelihood of a lot of that stevia getting to the target tissue that contains the lime is probably pretty small. And I find some people really like to go heavy duty on the stevia and they start getting all these gastrointestinal problems. So yeah, yeah. you wanna get a lot of gas and bloating and these kind of issues. If you've already got SIBO and you start adding stevia to the mix, there's a pretty good chance it's probably gonna exacerbate the condition. So stevia for me is really not my first choice. Again, I think, you know, something like serapeptase uh, with EDTA or lumbrokinase uh, is probably a reasonable place for most people to start. And you yeah. don't have to take all, you know, biofilm busters at the same time. I mean, you can pick your one or two and, you know, stick with that first and see how you feel. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think it's uh, one of the things I see all the time is that um, people are like thinking like, hey, some is good. Let's do a ton more. <laughs> you know, and you know, whatever yeah. biofilm buster I'm using. And I think that this most of the time applies to anything I'm doing. I mean, just yeah. add a little bit and work with it, you know, certain antibiotics and certain, you know, have to get to a certain dose for it to work, you know, uh, and certainly in an acute setting, if somebody comes in with say a Bell's palsy with a facial droop, that's brand new or a heart block, I'm probably going to just reach for my antibiotics to start. But outside of sort of the acute setting, most of our patients with chronic illness or sort of this slow insidious onset, we need to just work our way into it. And a lot of times I find that people are going too fast, too hard. And we're by, you know, putting like, you know, three biofilm busters and, you know, five different herbal tinctures going after Lyme and four for Bartonella. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's hard exactly. when you mix it all up. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think the other thing that happens a lot when people start their biofilm busters is they do get, you know, like a die off reaction, like a Herxheimer reaction. So maybe this segues nicely into, you know, how do you manage that when people start to take their biofilm protocol and they get worse? Right. So um, can I was just changing my earpieces there. So what was the last part of that there? So when people start their biofilm protocol and they start to feel worse, you know, how do you manage it? Yeah, that's a big one. Um, I think that the starting point for me is I start ahead of time. It's kind of like anything else. I want to prevent somebody from getting a tick bite. I also want to let them know that that biofilm die off is, is a possibility and it's a real deal. Right. So start slow, you know, start low and go slow. Um, other things is I prep people, you know, I mean, sometimes like a real Herxheimer is only going to be lasting a couple of days. Now there are different variations and you hear stories of these super long things. Right. But they're probably different kind of reactions, you know. So for the true Herxheimer, um, I certainly, you know, one knowledge is power. Knowing it's going to happen is potentially a good thing. 
detoxification, you're talking about like N-acetylcysteine as a potential glutathione precursor. You know, um, glutathione I use a fair amount of, um, you know, to just sort of acutely help. A lot of times in the acute sort of Herxheimer reaction, you know, all people taking 1,500 to two to 2,000 milligrams of liposomal glutathione along with maybe some lemon lime water and then also, um, you know, something like an Alka-Seltzer Gold or um, Pico, which is kind of like a, a different version you can get over at Walgreens and stuff, um, just to alkalinize and help detoxify. Um, certainly Berber and Parsley, I found, have been really good to be, you know, to use, you know, both in acute settings and chronic settings. And so, I mean, I just kind of, part of it is, don't go too fast. And the other part is, you know, that we didn't really touch on yet is that the other parts of detox that you build into your protocols. So, and I don't usually just like drop bombs on people. My feeling is why don't we get going um, and start off with something simple, you know, like let's get some rebuild the gut. Let's find, well, first of all, let's find out what the diagnosis is, then rebuild, you know, do the gut, do the right. detox and the whole nine yards. So we're kind of coming at it from the other side. So I know we're going to, we're planning on backtracking um, to address some of those other things I brought up. But yeah, I mean, I think the basic detox pieces are just to get started with um, the, the basics of detox and then also not dropping a nuclear bomb on day one or two. Right. Um, any tricks that you have, Darren? Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because I look at like Dr. Cowden's protocol and if you follow his protocol as it's laid out, the first two or three months are really just dedicated to detox. You know, you don't even really start getting into going after the organism until, you know, he feels like, you know, you've fully, you know, opened up all your detox pathways that so your body has the capacity to, you know, deal with the active treatment. So I think anything we can do and we can probably talk a little bit more later about some of our favorite detox strategies. But, you know, when the Herxheimer reactions come on, uh, I've used a lot of tri salts, which, uh, as you right. mentioned, is an alkalinizing agent. So it's a combination of sodium, potassium, and calcium bicarbonate, and they make it as a powder form or capsule form. The other version of this that you can find out there in the pharmacies is Alka Seltzer Gold. Uh, yeah. it, it's very similar in many ways, but we know that when you alkalinize the body, if you look at the research, it actually helps reduce inflammation, actually promotes cellular repair as well. So I, this has been used in environmental medicine for you know, 60, 70 years as a way of mitigating allergies, allergic reactions, inflammation. I mean, I've had kids in the middle of an asthma attack that can stop it by just taking you know, tri salt or baking soda. So right, this right. is a really cheap, uh, inexpensive way to help mitigate a lot of these Herxheimer reactions. And so you know, my patients will usually carry their tri salt or alka seltzer gold with them when they go out in public. Again, if they start to Herx when they're at work or just out and about in their day, it's really nice to have that on hand to help you know, mitigate their, uh, uh, their reaction. So that's one of my favorite ways. And you mentioned the Berber Panella from uh, Dr. Cowden Nutramedics. Right, I right. find that you know, people can take five drops every hour and a little glass of water. And usually after a matter of hours, their Herx reaction starts to mitigate. Oh, my um, God. It's it, Darren, sorry to interject, but it's, it's funny. When I, was, when I was training, I was told you can you, you know, do... Berber, um, do Berber for, uh, you know, like, um, you know, 10 drops every 10 minutes times eight. And if that doesn't work, do 10 drops of parsley every 10 minutes. Yeah. For eight. And then if you, if it, if it doesn't calm down after, you know, a bottle of each of those, you're pretty much screwed. But yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned earlier, and I think it's a good point. It's like, you know, how long is a Herxheimer reaction supposed to, to, to last? And I've had patients come in, I'm sure you have too, you know, they come and said, gosh, I've been herxing for three months. I'm like, well, that's not a herx anymore. That's you having a negative reaction to whatever treatment protocol you're on and you probably right, right. need to revamp it a little bit. Yeah, a true herx reaction is usually a matter of days and I've seen it maybe up, you know, 10 days, two weeks, but it doesn't yeah. usually last longer than that. If it's going on three, four, five weeks, there's probably a pretty good chance that whatever you're taking is just having an adverse reaction with you and you need to change up your protocol a little bit. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think the other thing is, you know, think about when, when the onset is, I know, like I have some people who take something and within like five or 10 minutes, there's, they're, they're, they're taking something and they're like, Oh my God, like I'm having this massive Herxheimer reaction. And at that point, it's not really even digested Yeah, <laughs> in most cases. And I see people, you know, with mast cell activation syndrome that can start to be triggered really quickly. Um, there's also sort of the component of expecting the Herxheimer, you know, yeah. and stuff that comes out. So, um, 
there's so many things that we have on our, I know we have a list of questions that everybody's thrown at us and we really wanted to talk about. Um, but I'm thinking maybe, um, I love the biofilm topic and we're, and maybe what we could do is circle around to the front end of this whole kind of conversation about where we get started. Um, that way we can kind of go in a little step-by-step -step order. I hope, sure. I don't know. Um, because like, I feel like I'm the way my brain thinks I'm like going backwards along that track and, and <laughs> which is good, but maybe we can fill in some people. And Diane had actually posted a, a question about, um, you know, she had two negative Lyme tests so far, but she had a rash on all the symptoms. And so a bunch of doctors said, you don't have it now it's a year or so later. Um, and you know, what am I supposed to do? Where do I go from here? Yeah, well, I think, you know, the, the end of the day, everyone needs to realize Lyme is a clinical diagnosis. I mean, even to go to the CDC's website, it says it right there. Mm -hmm. And it's still shocking to me that after, you know, 40 plus years of research on Lyme, that we still uh, are in this days that, you know, we rely so much on the test as a factor of you, know, you do or do not have Lyme. You know, Lyme is based on your clinical symptoms. And again, I was a microbiologist before I was a doctor. I actually used to do Lyme testing for a living. And, no, it, you know, it, yeah, you know, it, it's funny because this test was never designed to be diagnostic. It was actually designed as a surveillance tool to monitor the people that had known Lyme disease. You know, for right. the people who had the classic bullseye rash and headache and fever and so forth, they wanted a way to monitor these folks to make sure that, you know, their treatment was working, not really knowing at the time that antibodies, unfortunately, are not a reliable way to monitor treatment. But, you know, that's kind of what happened. So, you know, you've got to look at your clinical symptoms. So I think Lyme diagnosis is a combination of, you know, do you have the symptoms? Dr. Horowitz has a questionnaire that's been validated. I have a questionnaire in my book that's kind of a shortened version of his. Right. You know, these questionnaires are available to kind of give you a pretty good idea about your exposure. We do the testing anyway to kind of give us idea about whether you've had that exposure. And then you kind of have to rule out a bunch of other stuff. Right. So you know, Lyme's called the great mimic, the great imitator. It looks like a lot of other conditions. So part of us is, on our doctor side is that we're trying to rule out other possibilities that might explain your symptoms. Right. You know, and I think it's important to understand, like I went back in my residency training and I said, you know, what does the science actually tell us about this whole thing? And one of the things that it tells us is that, um, you know, if our pretest probability of having Lyme disease is greater than 80%, meaning we really think you have it, um, you know, if we do the test, we have a much greater likelihood of having a false negative. So right. basically, you know, if you're looking at your typical doctor's office, I mean, we need to look at this and say, hey, you live in a Lyme endemic area. You've got stuff going on like a rash that's consistent with an erythema migraine. So you've got Lyme disease, you know, especially now that I have symptoms on top of that. So, right. you know, I, I don't need to go and look for some other diagnosis and my, and, and I could use my testing to say, find out for sure, you know, or if I want to follow you. But to me at that point, you've got Lyme disease if you have the rash and symptoms. But the other part of what, what you have to think about if you do testing is, do you have a co-infection? Right. Right. And, and the other part about testing, just to kind of throw it out there, is when you have the rash, it's very early. And the likelihood of you actually developing antibodies to Lyme at that point is low. Right. right? You need three, four, six weeks in some cases to start doing that. So in an acute setting like that, something like a DNA test might be more valuable. Um, and a lot of times if I see somebody very early on, which I'm super happy I do because then, <laughs> then we have a chance, right? Yeah, it hardly ever happens, but... <laughs> yeah, at least not in our practices. I know it does in somebody's. And so hopefully they're going to start doing this and preventing chronic Lyme. But, you know, the, the, the point of it is, um, you know, we, we just need to go, we need to go through it and make a diagnosis, order the testing if it's appropriate. If it's too early, I you're going to order a test and you're going to be finding out what happened to this person earlier in their life, which is really right. helpful, but it may not, but, but I mean, it drives me nuts. They come in with an erythema migraines rash and joint pain, you know, you diagnose them with Lyme, you do the, the, the testing and it's negative three days later and you say, stop your treatment. I'm like, right. it's too early in the disease. 
Yeah, I, I, I swear, I think a lot of doctors like skip immunology in medical school and they forget how this whole process works once you get exposed to an organism in terms of, you know, the incubation period, the time you get exposed to an organism from the time you elicit an immune response. And we know with Lyme from the research, again, it can take, yeah, four to six weeks before you really start making antibodies. Mm -hmm. Although clinically, you can start getting symptoms sooner. So we certainly wouldn't want to delay treatment for someone who's suspected of having acute Lyme disease. And you know, I get this all the time where, in fact, I got three emails over the weekend of people who pulled ticks off their body, you know, that was embedded. And now what do I do? Right. You know, do, you, do you treat? Do you wait? You know, I think that becomes pretty confusing for people. And, you know, the old CDC recommendation of, you know, one dose of, you know, 200 milligrams of doxycycline, which has no scientific basis whatsoever, oh has God. never been shown to be helpful. Uh, well, you know, it, it's just, uh, it becomes a problem because people are getting under treatment, you know, when they have suspected exposure. Well, and one of the things that was really interesting, because I was on, you know, the panel where they, we reviewed the ILADS guidelines, where they really broke down and evaluated that study in a very open manner. The thing that we found was, they said it was like 87% effective in preventing a rash. But the problem is a rash does not equal Lyme disease, right? And so the CDC right. says at least 30% of people who get Lyme don't have a rash. In the research, when you look at it, it's like 40 to 60%. So call right. it 50-50 whether you're going to get a rash or not. And in my experience, it's lower than that. The yeah, other problem with the rash... A lot of people don't even know what the rash of is. They're looking for a bullseye. A bullseye is 20% of all erythema migraines, Lyme rashes. Right. right. So that's, a, that's a big problem. So, yeah. um, but what was interesting is in that study, if we assume that a rash is a good surrogate for Lyme, which it completely is not, but if it were, um, the problem is they had people in the study who developed Lyme disease and their blood tests remained negative. So, and the other prop, so we're blocking the ability of the body to make an antibody and we might be preventing a rash. So now two of the most commonly utilized diagnostic indicators in a primary care setting, pediatrician, internal medicine, family medicine, rash, and the positive tests have now been prevented by taking the pre Lyme prevention. The only problem is we've prevented all the indicators, but we've not prevented the disease. Right. Yeah, that, that's not what very do you do? <laughs> Well, and I think that's why, you know, doctors like you and I have a, a different approach, thank goodness, because it, it's not so short-sighted. And, you know, we rely more on, you know, we treat people, we don't treat pieces of paper. You know, the piece of paper is really nice to help confirm our suspicion. And, you know, again, as a former med tech, we used to do these tests. I, I hear this a lot. Well, I, I went, I had a Lyme test. My test came back positive, but I took it to my doctor and they said, no, I actually don't have Lyme disease. It's a false positive. And I can tell you from experience that false positives are rare, extraordinarily rare. False negatives are extremely common. But when you've got a false positive, I mean, when you've got a positive test, especially if you've gone to a regular conventional reference lab like Quest or LabCorp, uh, because they are notoriously negative when someone actually does have Lyme. So when you get a positive with them, you're pretty darn sure you've had exposure. Right. And, and so, you know, when you look at the meta analysis, right, so that's what we call it when we take a whole, when, when researchers evaluate critically a, several articles in the medical literature, looking at everything, you know, looking at a particular topic, in this case, what they call the two tier testing strategy, right? So a screening evaluation followed by a Western blot to confirm it if it's positive or borderline. And what they found was that across the board, if you have a, if you're, if you're positive, it's like 99 to hundred percent, you're positive. Yep. Right. But if you're negative, we might miss 40, you know, 44% of people who are truly positive. Yeah. So it's, it's like, it's not a problem with the test being good. If it's positive, it's a problem of what does it mean if it's negative? Um, and so that's really the problem. Um, you know, and, and testing is difficult. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different strategies to do. And I think that what people really should understand is that it is exactly what Darren was saying. You know, it's a clinical diagnosis supported by laboratory data. And we really need to, that's where we need to go with it. You know, you need to know that the, the, the um, clinical diagnosis. And when you're talking about the, um, the, the questionnaires, I, I didn't want to forget to mention something. In Dr. Horowitz's questionnaire, one of the most important things to consider 
is migratory joint pain, right? right? I mean, what other disease process do you know has pain that moves from one area to another, then to another, and then back to somewhere, then to a different place, and now over here, you know? And so migratory joint pain is critical to think about. Um, yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I've actually had this discussion with a lot of other practitioners that will argue with me. It's like, no, 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 there's a whole bunch of other things that cause migratory joint pain. I'm like, name one. Name one. <laughs> Name one, because I, I can't think of it. It's not Ryder syndrome. It's not rheumatoid arthritis. It's not lupus. It's not the flu. I mean, all these classic, you know, autoimmune diseases we associate with arthritis, I'm not aware of any, and I've heard Dr. Horowitz speak more than once and say this, that it's true. I, mean, I can't find anything that causes migratory joint pain. Right. You know, typically, if you've got other conditions that affect the joints, it tends to be the same joints. It's consistent. It's bilateral, like in case often in rheumatoid arthritis. So when you hear about it's my right shoulder, it's my left knee, it's my right ankle, and it changes day to day to day. Again, I'm not aware of anything else other than Lyme that causes that. Right, right. And I mean, I think the thing is, you know, I have like some right knee pain and some right shoulder pain from time to time, but I did a lot of sports and I busted them up but it doesn't change and it's always consistent. And it, and, you know, it's not like I have, you know, the one shoulder, then the hip and then the other knee and then the other ankle and then the other hip that wasn't the first hip, you know, that kind of thing. So that's important. Yeah. Um, one of the things you brought up, Darren, was what the heck do you do? I mean, I got this call a couple times this week already. It sounds like you got three over the weekend. What are you recommending to people in place of maybe this 200 milligrams of doxycycline if they got bitten by a tick? Um, or what's your thought process? Do you recommend prophylactic preventive treatment or take us through that? Yeah, so for me, you know, I tell people if they find a tick and particularly if the tick is embedded. Now look, if you found a tick and it's literally just walking across your skin and there's no evidence that it's right. bit you, just pull the tick off and dispose it and it's fine. You know, if it's walking across you, it hasn't attached to you, it hasn't had a blood meal, it hasn't shared anything yet, so you're pretty safe. You know, ticks don't typically feed off you, have a blood meal, and then cruise around your body. Once they're done, they tend to detach themselves and they fall off. So uh, a walking around ticks probably okay. But if it's embedded in you, you definitely want to get some tweezers. You want to grab it by his head, lift it straight up gently. Don't yank it out. Uh, don't dump gasoline on it. Don't light a cigarette or a match and try and burn it out. All these other old wives' tales are more likely to cause harm than good. So just get some fine tweezers. And if you don't have any and you live in a Lyme endemic area, please go buy some. And they actually right. make these cool ones that have a little magnifying glass at the end so you can actually see the tick. Dude, they're so helpful. Yeah, because I mean, these ticks under, you know, a, a nymph is, a, you know, the size of a pinhead. It's really, really tiny and hard to see. I can remember living in Connecticut. I had a tick on me and I thought it was a fleck of dirt and I kept flicking it and then it started moving. I'm like, okay, that's <laughs> not dirt. Dirt doesn't walk. So, you know, they can be really hard to see, but those tweezers can be really helpful in just, you know, dislodging the tick. And if you can keep it, you know, put it in just a Ziploc baggie, put like a damp cotton ball in there. And I like to save it so you can send the tick off and be tested. Right. Uh, and there's a lot of great labs that do tick testing. They can test for, you know, Lyme and all the co-infections for a pretty reasonable price. And although it's not perfect, you know, no testing is, it right. at least will give you an idea about whether that tick may be carrying Lyme and that might help guide your treatment moving forward. But right. if I know it's a deer tick, uh, my feeling is I'd rather start treatment right away until proven otherwise, just because we know that early treatment is less likely to lead any kind of chronic problems. And for me, you know, now having been in the game now for about 20 years, I actually use herbs. I find herbs are very effective, but I have the discussion with my patients and that if they want to use antibiotics, I think that's a very appropriate use in early right. Lyme. You know, you've got a good chance of, you know, getting rid of it before it ever becomes chronic. So I think you know, for me, I have that discussion about antibiotics and herbs. We talk about it. We decide together what we think is in the best interest. But you know, as a naturopath and trained herbalist, I have a lot of faith in herbs. I've used them very successfully for a long time, and I think they work as well with, as antibiotics without causing some of the gut disruption. But uh, again, it's really, I think, personal preference. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I'm in the same boat. I use antibiotics. I use herbs. I probably use more antibiotics in that situation than maybe you would just based on where my training is and stuff. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, the thing you have to understand just from like, what's the duration of treatment? And some people have been asking in the comments, like, what's the duration of treatment in general? What do I do with different tests? And we're going to roll into that. But for preventive treatment, we don't know, right? I mean, the yep. studies that are out there are not all that good. What we do know is that if you take a mouse and you inject it with Lyme disease, or you inject it with Lyme and 
um, anaplasmosis, if we give them a 19 day long acting doxycycline shot, it works 100%. So most of us are kind of talking about, you know, if you're going to do a treatment, do it at least three weeks, if not four to six weeks. I mean, is that kind of the ballpark you're, you're starting at? Yeah, for me, it's usually six weeks. I think, you know, understand that Lyme is a very slow replicating organism. Most bacteria in your body replicate every 10 to 20 minutes. And Lyme, if you look at the research, is every one to 16 days. So that's extraordinarily slow. And consider that like an antibiotic like doxycycline, it actually doesn't kill the bug. It stops the bug from replicating. Right. It's a bacteria static antibiotic, not a bacteriocidal. So, you know, 10 days of antibiotics, if you follow the CDC's recommendation, and they give you 10 days of doxycycline, and the organism replicates every 16 days, you literally haven't even gone through one life cycle of the organism to have a chance to actually kill it. So that's why, you know, we always recommend these longer courses of treatment. And our, our prototype is tuberculosis. You know, if you ever get TB, you're going to be on antibiotics, three of them for six months to a year. And the reason you're on yeah, so at long, least, right. Right. And the reason you're on so long is because it's just such a slow growing organism. Well, not Lyme's not that slow, but it is relatively Pretty slow. Damn close. <laughs> So, yeah, exactly. So, you know, we've got to use these longer courses of treatment. And again, I think most of us feel like we can do things to help protect your gut, protect your mitochondria, protect your other parts that might be affected by the initial treatment versus what would happen if it developed into persistent Lyme. And now you're into a whole different, you know, ball of wax. Right. And I think you, a couple of things that like, as you were talking through the last couple of things that I really think are key for people to understand is one is you said you sit down and talk to the patient. Right. Which is just like, you know, this is an amazing thing in medicine these days. It's like you find out, do they prefer herbs? Do they prefer meds? What is their medical you know, model? Um, the other thing is with doxycycline being bactericidal or static, I should say, um, you know, we a lot of what you and I are doing is actually helping a person's immune system kind of reboot and, and lift up your immune system because your, your body is doing most of it. I've never asked any doctor who works in a critical care unit or pulmonology if our antibiotics, no matter how strong they are, if they kill all of the, pneumon the pneumonia. Pretty much everybody says what ends up happening is your bot we just keep you in a good place and keep the level of the bacteria down until right. your body can take care of it. And that's so critical in everything else. And it, it's no different in Lyme disease. And I mean, I think the other part too is, you know, after the tick is fed, it's not going much anywhere. And if anybody wants to look on Facebook, Instagram, you can take a look at like, I posted some videos my daughter took of a engorged tick. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it do, it's on its back going, woo, you know, um, it's kind of gross, but it's out there, you know, <laughs> to see. Um, you know, and, and, and it's important to understand that in Lyme disease, at least with the de deer tick, the exoides tick in North America and on the e most of the country is the deer tick. There's a little changes in the West Coast with the Western black legged tick and such. But the bottom line is 95% of the Lyme is being transmitted by a nymph, right? And the nymph is the size of a poppy seed, a poppy seed, right? So go grab a bagel and look at the little black dot. Now drop one of those, you know, on the table and go find it, right? I mean, it's small. So that's why a lot of people are getting them and not seeing the tick bite. So, Right. And remember, too, that the ticks like to go to the areas of the body that often you don't see. It likes those warm, moist areas of the body. So it likes your groin, behind your knee. I got bit behind my butt cheek, so I didn't see. I had a big bullseye rash, but I couldn't see it because it was behind me. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, it was in your ears, your hairline. I mean, I've seen these rashes, you know, for those who do get it pop up in really bizarre places, but often they're in places that people don't generally look. So particularly for, I think, parents, you know, with your kids when they're out playing outdoors, if you live in a Lyme endemic area, I mean, I tell parents, strip your kids down head to toe and look in all the cracks and crevices and they may not like it. But uh, again, it just increases your likelihood of picking up a tick if there's one that might be attached. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I got, I got uh, interviewed by Men's Health a while back and they said, how do you, how do you keep ticks off your privates, basically, <laughs> you know? And, and I said, well, one of the things that I have people do is wear sort of, you know, like compression shorts and boxers that, that are kind of like not so sporty, super compression, but yeah. they're kind of skin tight and a skin tight shirt that's like of that material actually can help keep them out of your armpits and your groin. So yeah. The thing people also have to realize, though, is Lyme is considered paradomestic, right? Which is basically saying that about 75% of people who get Lyme get it in their yard or their neighbor's yard. It's not out in the woods. 
It's not in all these high risk places. It's actually in your yard because it likes the habitat of, you know, we have the woods in the back and then we have the mo the lawn mowed perfectly. We have these beautiful gardens and that's where all the chipmunks and the mice are living. And that's a perfect habitat for the ticks. You know, that that's their blood meal. So right. um, just think about it. It's, it's not when you take a long hike in the woods, you got to be careful then, but it's most important to think about, um, you know, what goes on like right at your own house and you take the dogs out, you know, or you run around before school in the morning and you haven't put anything on. So, um, yeah. yeah. Well, well, I think that's what happened to me when I got Lyme. I sure I got it from, uh, uh, my dog, you know, I wouldn't spend a lot of time outdoors. I lived in Connecticut an endemic area, but I never went hiking through the woods and I would spend right. a little time out of my lawn. But, you know, the dog was out every day doing her business. And we also had a dog that slept in the bed at night. So I'm quite sure I got exposed through that. And uh, I mean, you know, checking your pets is equally important as, you know, checking yourselves, because I think they're a common reason a lot of people get exposed to Lyme. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, you know, it's, it's like before and after we started treating our yards, um, you know, and we use a local company that does both the bait boxes and some spraying of some relatively non-toxic, but kind of toxic stuff. But it's like, I, I, there's nothing else we can do. You know, we need to prevent it. And it's like, we would see our, our, you know, I had cats and dogs before I knew anything about Lyme disease, um, really. So we, you know, and they, cats live forever as anybody or most people with cats know. I mean, so they were bringing them in. And until we started to treat them, treat the yard, double check ourselves, we really, we our exposure was so, you know, our risk was so high. Yeah. Um, so there's a whole bunch of questions popping up um, and I'm trying to keep track of them. And I know that you've got some other ones, but we kind of talked a little bit about testing. Um, you know, some, some people want to know about specifically what labs you're thinking about using. Um, I, I feel like that's sort of a Pandora's box, but I think we could touch on that. And then I wanted to dovetail into treatment. Um, and, and part of the treatment questions were treatment of an asymptomatic person with positive labs treatment of a, you know, a person um, maybe who's been sick for a couple of years and what might we be doing in that, that uh, sense. Sure. So we can, we, just to sort of kind of organize ourselves a little bit, because I want to make sure we get to as many questions as we can. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, you know, when it comes to Lyme labs, uh, again, it's, it's, it's sort of personal preference. I think we all have the ones that we favor for whatever reason. Right. Uh, again, being someone who used to work in the field, I feel a little bit biased in this. Uh, I think uh, my personal opinion uh, for one of the best screening labs out there, I like Global Lyme Diagnostics. Uh, in full disclosure, I'm on their scientific advisory board, but I joined it for a reason because the doctor that developed this test was a vaccinologist. He was actually trying to develop a test, or excuse me, a vaccine for dogs for Lyme disease. And in his research, he discovered that there's a, a part of the Lyme organism that's unique to all the different strains of Lyme. You know, the conventional test that's out there really only looks at one strain. That's Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the first species that we discovered in Lyme, Connecticut back in the 80s. And we've now learned that there's several other strains that can cause Lyme disease, but right. the testing still only reflects really the one test. So what I like about this lab is that if you've been exposed to other strains of Lyme that's not Borrelia burgdorferi, you have a greater chance of picking it up through global Lyme diagnostics than you would from potentially other labs. So they're kind of one of my go-to screening labs for Lyme patients. Uh, it's a cash test, unfortunately. Insurance doesn't currently reimburse for it as far as I know. I think it's $295 for the test. But again, they do an IgG and IgM test that uh, uh, again, might show if they had exposure to any of the Borrelia species. And then I like medical diagnostic labs in Hamilton, New Jersey for a while. Where I grew up, just so you know. <laughs> hometown <Jersey>. boy. <laughs> but I like Literally, that's my hometown. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, I mean, I, I like MDL because, again, you know, they do, I think, high quality testing. I also like the fact that they're the only lab that I know of that actually sends me a copy of the Western blot. So I can look at it myself and look at the different bands and antibodies. They do all the co-infection testing. And the biggest thing for me is that they bill insurance. Right. You know, people are spending so much money out of pocket uh, that this is at least something that insurance will reimburse. And for people who don't have insurance, they have a very inexpensive cash pricing system. So uh, IGNX is a great lab. I love them. I use them periodically. Again, they're just, uh, it's cash pay outside of Medicare. Yeah. So 
for a lot of people, it's just a bit cost prohibitive. Uh, Armin Labs, I like early in line because it's not testing antibodies, it's testing cytokines, which are different part of your immune system. So you can get cytokine activity before you get an antibody response. So for people who might be in that first week or two of exposure, that might be a more appropriate lab to use. Uh, so, so those are some of my favorites. Which labs are you using, Tom? Well, uh, you know, it's interesting that you bring up the early stuff too, because I use actually a fair amount of Imogen and they're out of Massachusetts. They were recently bought by Quest, which is rad for people around me. Now, you know, to, there's no lab that I think is perfect, right? Um, but, you know, so, so I use a little bit of everybody, but I'm really against, and I like the way you're talking about, I pick and choose the ones I need these are my workhorses, but I'm going to use the lab the person needs because, right. you know, I see people spending two and three thousand dollars at Igenix, and you know what? Somebody probably needs to do that, but I would be willing to bet that most of those times it would have been better off. You know, that money would have been better spent somewhere else, like keeping it in your pocket, probably. You know, <laughs> so um, the th the the things that are important to me is I use Imogen for a couple of reasons. One is, it, you know, now it goes through insurance. Um, you know, with Quest, for most of my people, they have great cash pay prices. They are fast as hell. I mean, I get results in two to four days, wow. right? That's and amazing. so I've had people come into my office and they look like crap and I've treated them for Lyme in the past. They had recovered, they're doing well. They don't look well. They feel like they have the same thing again. And I said, all right, well, uh, we'll start these treatments, you know, and this person in particular preferred herbals. But then I said, we can do that, but you don't look the normal way you look. Let's get some testing. And I wanted quick stuff. I went to Imogen and like two days later, they had DNA confirmation of Babesia, Anaplasma. They had wow. Anaplasma antibodies. They had Borrelia miyamotoi and they had Lyme disease. They had every single known pathogen that we can all agree gets transmitted by a freaking deer tick. They have, and you know, and the problem was they, he had no white cells. His red cells were really low. So he was anemic and he had low platelets. So he was ready to bleed to death at any point. And I thought I might have to send him to the hospital for blood transfusion. But it was like, I in one day, it was like one hour I got the Babesia, then I got the Anaplasma, and a couple hours later I got the Borrelia miyamotoi. And it was like so quick. And for me, that's really helpful in the acute setting because you save people's lives when they end up with four co-infections. Yeah. Um, so, but chronically I like them too because they do an IgM, an IgA, and an IgG antibody screen and two IgG Western blots of different strains. And I can ask for an IgM if, I, if I'm nice. And they have a great Borrelia miyamotoi serology. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll order the general panel from there and then I'll, and um, also the DNA if it's appropriate, but not all the time. And, um, and then I'll do like an IgM Western blot at Igenix and I might use um, typically for Bartonella Hensley, I'm using Galaxy, but I'm only using the antibodies. And what's interesting is I hear a lot of people talk about they're not getting positive Bartonellas. And I mean, when I have somebody that I order tests for Bartonella on, it, it's almost always positive. You know, it's not, you know, I don't, so I, I don't know what the issues are there. And it's clinically, it makes sense. Um, but the other comment too, because um, I, and also before I forget, I do use a fair amount of arm and I think they're very helpful. Um, and a lot of times you'll see the cytokine response or the antibody response, but not both. So that's kind of, I find helpful. And some people where I'm like, hey, look, the antibodies all went away, but there, I'm just, I'm, I'm not sure. I go back and I find out that actually, you know, there was a problem there. And, you know, they do have some cytokine reactivity. We treat that. And now I feel a little more comfortable. Um, but the other comment too is I don't think it's important for everybody to be, every time you order tests on somebody to be positive. Like I've heard people say, I don't like the way you test because yeah. when I send labs to that lab, my people are always negative. So yeah. I'm like, well, that's interesting because I get a fair amount of positives there and I also get a fair amount of negatives. So there's either the test wasn't all that good or the other part was um, you were ordering a test on somebody and they didn't have what you thought they had. I mean, that's possible too. Yeah, well, yeah. That's, that's a great point. And I, I've seen this probably more with practitioners than patients. They keep ordering lab after lab after lab, waiting for their positive. And it's like, look, if you have someone who's symptomatic and they've got all the clinical signs, just treat them. I mean, you don't need the lab to, to prove it, but they keep wanting to have that concrete something to stand on, which we all like to have that evidence. But 
you know, it, it ends up being very time consuming and costly to keep ordering, you know, two, three, four, five labs because you keep getting negatives. And remember too, if you're doing an antibody test, it's also depending on you having a healthy immune response. If right. you have any element of immune deficiency or immune dysfunction, and you just don't readily make antibodies, it doesn't matter what lab you use, you know, you're going to run into the same problem. So, you know, right. don't beat a dead horse if it's if you've got the clinical symptoms and you feel confident someone's been exposed to Lyme or you've been exposed to Lyme and your test kind of keeps coming up negative. You know, I, I think my my best example, and I've shared this before, uh, there was a doctor in Colorado and his story is very public. I'm not sharing anything that's not known. Uh, he was right. an oncologist who was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease and he was in hospice and had about six months to live. And a friend said, hey, were you ever tested for Lyme? And he said, no. So he did. I think it was Igenex. And his right. test was completely negative, not one single antibody. And the guy, he says, well, I see, I don't have Lyme. Okay, well, long story short is he ended up going on IV antibiotics just to try because he had nothing to lose. And he completely recovered, got out yeah. of hospice. He actually went back into full-time practice treating Lyme patients. And I think he said it was his sixth test before he turned positive. He was so immune dysfunctional or deficient. Mm -hmm. it just took, Once he started treating and kind of stirred up the pot, then he was able to enlist an antibody response. So when we're doing antibody testing, I mean, this is true for Lyme and any other microbe. If you know you get a negative, it doesn't always mean that you don't have it or haven't been exposed. Sometimes it just means your immune response isn't the way you know it's supposed to be. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think it's also important too. Is sometimes Lyme also knows how to hide, right? Like, right. Yeah. and I hear, and so, and it, and it evades your immune system. And so, a lot of people are talking about, hey, you know, Lyme disease has like been there's this conspiracy theory the government's done something to it, you know, and that's all well and good. It might be possible that that happened in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, but if you look at ticks from 13 million years ago, they've been found to have Lyme, like the, the Borrelia bacterium in them. And right. if you want to look at Rocky Mountain spider fever, anaplasma, things that are in this rickettsial, um, you know, family, they've been found in ticks that are over a hundred million years old. So yeah. these things way predate human beings and they've been around long enough that they, they, they know how to survive. So, and they're slow reproducing. They go in places where our immune system can't get to. They go to places our antimicrobials can't get to. So no kidding. I mean, so I, I've also heard of some practitioners that they'll they'll just start treating you if it sounds clinically right, and they test you six weeks later. Yeah. They won't even waste their time because of that. What all the things you're highlighting. Yeah, and I, I think that's not an unreasonable approach. Again, we all like to have something to stand on to feel like you know we're not wasting your time and money on treatment that you don't need. But we also know that there's the capacity when you start stirring up the pot that you can get a greater immune response. So I think that's a reasonable approach. And if someone's proposed that to you, I would certainly follow through with that because again, if you've had a negative test, you know, once you start any kind of treatment, there's a good probability that at some point you know, you'll start to make antibodies and that will be more evident that you actually are on the right track. Yeah. So what do you do? So kind of the flip side of this is you have somebody who's got a whole bunch of positive bands everywhere and, but they have no symptoms. Yeah. So asymptomatic patient with positive lab tests. Right. So remember what the test is testing. The testing is testing for antibodies. So if you get bit by a tick that carries Lyme, and it injects its saliva into your skin, into your tissue, your immune system reacts. If you are a healthy person with a healthy immune system, you can elicit this very efficient antibody response that basically takes care of the organism before it ever got to a point that it triggered symptoms. So in my world, if I see someone with positive antibodies and no symptoms, I personally don't treat. Uh, I think the likelihood of it, you know, when people have Lyme, they're usually symptomatic. Is it possible that it's dormant? that it might come out later, it's possible. But I've also seen people that were feeling reasonably well, they start treatment and now they feel really horrible. So sometimes you can make things worse by stirring up the pot. And if you let the immune system do what it's made to do, it might get rid of it without having to intervene further. So for me, I think being a little least invasive at that point, if someone truly is asymptomatic, of course, then again, I'm not testing healthy people. So <laughs> um, I know other doctors, you know, it's usually it's a family member that has Lyme. The whole family now wants to be tested to see if they have exposure, even though they don't have symptoms. So yeah, I think in that case, um, I, I've done it before. I don't really like to do it because I think it just breeds more unnecessary concern than you need to have. I'm like, if you're not having symptoms, we're not necessarily going to treat it anyway. I know, but we want to know, okay, well, it's your money, it's your choice, and I'm happy to go along with it. But 
I'm just a little amiss of treating people certainly aggressively if they're not experiencing symptoms. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think the same thing is like, I, I, I'm not going to go looking for it in a healthy person because they probably fought it off if they have it. Looks like we're having a little bit of a connection issue. I, I don't know. It looks like it's on my end over here. I don't know if your IG is still working there. Uh, yeah, you look like you're frozen there. Yeah. Somebody said what happened. I don't know. I still have Wi-Fi, but who knows? So we'll just keep doing the best we can here. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I, and I, again, like I always wonder why did we order the test? And if a person is truly, um, you know, um, if they're truly asymptomatic, why did we do it? Um, let's see here. Keeps pausing. Yeah, unfortunately, I see that. I don't know. Uh, why. I stop the Instagram feed and restart it. We can do that. Yeah, let's do that real quick here. And we can share. Let's try this again for everybody. Let's try. All right, we're live again. Let's try this and um, see if we can find Darren again. Now I've got a list of a million people. Here we go. Let's try this one again. <laughs> Love technology. Maybe you're there. Yeah, I just sent you a request there. Yep, so there we go. Should pop up momentarily. Thanks for de for um, waiting for Darren. Unable to join. Wow, this is fun. <laughs> oh, you know why? It looks like our thing dropped down. Give it, bear with us just a second. It looks like our it it my my home's thing shot out, but it's back on. I just have to get it to reconnect here. Sorry about that, everybody. So, Tom, maybe while you're uh, doing the technical stuff, I saw a couple of questions popped up here on our Facebook feed. Cool. Let's do it. Uh, Sarah is asking, what are your thoughts on peptide therapy? Haha. -ha. I was hoping you were going to take that one. <laughs> since, <laughs> so, I, since I know that you actually went to the peptide course and I have not been yet. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think peptide therapy is very promising. It's, it's still a relatively new uh, aspect of medicine. I am just now starting to use it in my practice. So in full disclosure, I'm a newbie and I have not used very much of it. Uh, I think, you know, the, oh, I got dropped off again. Yep. I just had to reboot. Sorry. I'm going to send you a thing right now. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, something like the BPC-157 has been used a lot in Lyme patients as really a way of kind of stimulating your immune system. There are other peptides that can be used as an anti-inflammatory. So I think they've got a lot of potential benefit. It's just you have to uh, be very uh, cautious with your dosing because uh, typically these are things you're injecting every day. And for some people I, I've, I've, who I've seen, even though I haven't been the prescriber, they've done it with other practitioners. And then they come back and tell me that they feel <laughs> like they're overreacting or they're having almost like a hurt. <laughs> so, uh, how's your Instagram there? Uh, let me try getting rid of Instagram and I'll come back to it. Okay. All right. Sorry guys on the IG, but everybody on Facebook, thanks for dealing with us. We're trying to fix that up. Um, Okay, so I, I see back up. Darren joined. All right. Let's see if we can. You join. Let me see if it'll let you in for real. There we go. Got to love it. You know, I, I tell this story a lot. Okay. I have a friend who has a Tesla, and he can drive his car to himself outside of a restaurant by touching a, a button on his phone. Okay. Sure. And we can't keep this going. All right. There is Dr. Darren. Fantastic. Okay. Okay, so to round out the peptide therapy, so yeah, I think it has a lot of benefit. Uh, definitely, if you can get in the hands of a practitioner that's been doing it a while, I know there aren't a lot. Uh, I think it has a lot of potential upsides as a way of modulating the immune system. You know, my view of Lyme disease overall is it's really a problem with chronic immune dysfunction, which is why people end up with chronic Lyme. And if you can help facilitate better immune function, this is a way to do it. So uh, definitely, it's something that's, uh, I said, I just went to a peptide seminar a couple of weeks ago, and we are just now starting to implement it. So I'm looking forward to using more of it. Uh, come back to me in six months, and we'll talk about this again, and uh, I'll have more to report. 
Yeah. And Darren told me I have to wait till like the fall till the next course. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon was actually on with us a moment ago on IG. I think we we lost her, <laughs> but I know she does a bunch of peptide therapies. I was almost going to plug her in and see if she could help us out there. But yeah, there's a lot of information out there on it. Um, so um, one of the other questions that came up in the comments um, that I figure we should get to at one point or another now seems like a really good time. What are your thoughts on immunizations? Because... And I think this can dovetail into like your approach to treating Lyme because I think it kind of goes hand in hand, I think, if I know you well enough. <laughs> yeah. So you're talking about just immunizations as a whole? Right. And I mean, I think a lot of times the problem is like, you know, in California, it sounds like they got rid of the re religious or exemption. And in Connecticut, yeah. they don't really like that. And the medical exemption is basically like, um, you know, are you like, you know, going to die, of, you know, eminently from a particular vaccination. And even if you've almost died from another one, it doesn't matter, you still can get a different one. Yeah. And I know there's a lot of concern about that. So, especially now with the, you know, with the, with the measles outbreaks and stuff like that. So, and particularly the question I think had to do with stuff uh, in, in, in terms of, you know, um, in a chronic Lyme patient, but in general also, I guess, cause yeah. you work a lot with autism and prevention too. Well, you know, my biggest concern is if you look at the way most vaccines work is that most of them contain a thing called an adjuvant and it's something else that's added. In many cases, it's aluminum and it's a way of helping stimulate immune response to whatever you're mixing with. So if you take actual measles and you inject pure measles into your body, your immune system will do absolutely nothing with it. It won't recognize it. That's not the normal path by which we get exposed to measles. It's usually it's respiratory. So if they just inject measles virus, your body won't do anything. It won't make any kind of antibody response. So they have to add an adjuvant, something to get your body to identify the measles to actually stimulate that immune response. Well, when using something like aluminum, which is a known neurotoxin, and if you've got someone with chronic Lyme that already has neurological impairment, right. is there going to be any damaging effect from that adjuvant? You know, to be honest, you know, we don't really study it that way because it's considered an inert ingredient. The vaccine manufacturers are not required to study it. We know from toxicology studies that aluminum is very toxic. So my biggest concern as a chronic Lyme patient is with any vaccine, you know, what's their body going to do with these adjuvants? Is it possible to stimulate some sort of hyperimmune response that might flare their symptoms? And indeed, I have seen that in clinical practice. So, uh, you know, for someone who needs to be vaccinated for whatever purposes, uh, they've got to be very cautious with it. They got to do it slowly. I would certainly never do more than one vaccine at a time. Um, right. Again, I, I think depending on what you're vaccinating against, uh, and that's kind of a whole different story. But unless it's something that, you know, is really urgent or potentially life threatening to that particular patient, uh, if it's something that's a nuisance illness, um, then my preference is that they, they wait until they're in better state of health, if at all. But you know, if there's any evidence of autoimmunity for me, that's usually something that I advocate for holding off because I don't know it's safe for the person at that point. Right. So, um, and, you know, and, and in my case, I would, you know, I agree, like, you know, it's like, I think we do too much at once a lot of times and we give it to people, you know, the whole point is to stimulate in, in a reaction so that your body can make antibodies to it. And if you're already sick to something else and you have fever and all this, why am I doing it? You know, or in the case of the chronic Lyme pair person with the uh, suppressed immune system, are you you're really even going to have a good reaction, a, a positive response, like a positive vaccine response to it? And we haven't really studied those things. It's just like, when you go back to testing, no one studied Lyme and Babesia in the same sample. Right. We do a Lyme test, we do a Babesia test, we do a Bartonella test, but we don't know if they act, it's not been validated if we put them all together. And it's right. the same thing. It's like we study vaccine response in healthy people. We don't go, oh, here's some really, you know, screwed up, you know, guy named Tom and let's vaccinate the crap out of him. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, here's a perfectly healthy individual and let's try this one thing and it looks good. Now let's just slam it all together. And I don't know that it, that's been tested, you know. Um, well, you know, and I think to your point too, you know, the concept of a vaccine is given to a healthy person to elicit this immune response. But, you know, they don't study these in unhealthy people. So what are the potential long-term implications in giving a vaccine to an unhealthy person? 
I mean, kind of along that lines, I see a lot of kids who go in for a sick visit with their pediatrician that get a vaccine. I mean, that's an actual medical contraindication. You don't vaccinate sick kids. Their immune system's not healthy enough to handle the load and probably won't produce the appropriate antibody response, but they do it anyway. So, right. you know, I think you have to take in consideration, you know, again, this is where I think, you know, medicine's gotten away from being very individualized. And we're I'm trying right. to put everybody in the same mold, but I think for a lot of Lyme patients, because they're, you know, we got a lot of evidence of immune dysfunction. I mean, there's plenty of studies now to show that we've got a lot of research showing that uh, causes an autoimmune problem. So with all these immune issues going on, uh, again, I, I just think it's uh, playing with fire a little bit. Right. Yeah. When people are a bit healthier, I mean, certainly, um, you know, I've done when people need to get a vaccine or they, they, their parents believe in it, but they don't want those toxic adjuvants to have as much of an issue, you know, doing mitochondrial support and detoxification around yeah. the time of vaccination can be helpful. But again, it's like, it goes back to like, Darren sits down and talks to people and he finds out what they're interested in, what they want to do, you know? And when you do that, man, it's like, you can have a conversation and we're not so worried about losing that person and we're never going to give them a vaccine that potentially they might really need um, right. if that's the decision in that particular situation because you're going to have good follow-up because you actually have a relationship. And it's not just like, you know, I went I went to the vet the other day. I love my vet, but she was just like, oh, your dog's overdue for rabies. And next thing I know, they're stabbing a rabies in them. I'm like, well, hold on here, you know? Yeah. Like this thing is such a thing called informed consent and not just like slam it in your face. You yeah. Know? Yeah, yeah so, it, it's. I think it just needs to be very individualized. And again, if that's something that's on your uh, agenda, you know, have a conversation with your healthcare provider. You know, talk through it about whether it's appropriate for you at that time. And maybe at a later date, it is. But you know, yeah, California. You know, we've got a, a problem here because they've gotten rid of you know, pretty much all exemptions. We now have a bill that's trying to get rid of medical exemptions. They want to have a state appointed official determine whether your child qualifies for a medical exemption. Well, we could so, fix that. Just make that you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I, it's, I think it creates a lot of problems. And again, it really just takes the doctor patient relationship out of our hands and puts it into the hands of a politician. So yeah, uh, I don't have great solutions for it. I know that there are a lot of people in California, including myself, that are, you know, advocating for parent rights, for people's rights. I don't think any medical thing should be forced on anybody. We actually have an international treaty a, treaty saying we won't do that. But, you know, that's how politics go. So we'll keep fighting and um, we'll see where that lands. Yeah, uh, Tom, exactly. I was just seeing some other questions here. We may want to get to these are kind of interesting. Uh, Laura's asking. Uh, I just realized my question wasn't very direct. I think we missed her other question. What are your opinions on Lyme transference to infants? Yeah, well, it happens, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, and, and so I wrote a note on Laura's question too. We have a couple other great ones also. And, you know, the, for me, transmission of Lyme is most commonly, like probably way greater than 90% from a tick to a person. Right. And, and I, I have to say, I'm kind of a little frustrated. Everybody's trying to tell you about the mosquito and the horse fly and the blood and the saliva and all this other stuff. And the science is weak. And, you know, we're taking away the, the focus on the tick bite and tick bite prevention being the number one way to prevent Lyme. Now, with that said, now that I probably pissed off like a hundred thousand people, <laughs> you know, I mean, we do know that, um, spirochetes can be transmitted and cause Lyme from a mom to an unborn child. I mean, that's been published multiple times. I hear that some people don't believe it, and I'm pretty sure they came from the same institution that published the first case of it. So uh, it, that is in the medical literature, and I think it's a right. real potential problem. Now, the information we have about transplacental transmission or vertical, meaning from mom to the unborn baby, is you know that active Lyme disease untreated is really bad and people with chronic Lyme uh, the information is really not as clear but we do think that we want to do everything possible which usually includes some form of treatment to prevent that. Now breast milk transmission is something I get asked about all the time and while we can find spirochetes in the breast milk I'm unaware of any sort of studies that show or even cases that show that it happens a lot of people worry about it, but we haven't seen it happen. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And the same thing, like, you know, with sexual transmission, 
it seems like there's a small group of researchers who really are invested in making this a real thing. And I, I don't really care if it's real or not. I just want to know if it's real, right? I'm not invested yeah. in it being an STD. What I'm invested in is finding out, are there other ways people get Lyme and do it and get it? So the evidence of sexual transmission, like solid in the medical literature is really um, not all that good. But there are a lot of cases, and I've had these patients. I st when I studied with Dr. Horowitz, people told me about it. Pretty much every Lyme doc I know talks about Somebody says, oh, I gave it to my partner. I gave it to so-and-so, you know, um, sexually. And is it possible? We, we can find uh, spirochetes on the female cervix and in semen, but that doesn't mean it is transmissible. But, you know, the possibility is, is, is certainly there. Um, so it, it's something to think about. Um, over here, Mellow Candle said something about I was pregnant when I contracted Lyme but her daughter shows no symptoms should she be concerned. What's your take, Dr. Ingalls? <laughs> yeah, well, again, I see a lot of children in my practice and, you know, mom had Lyme when she was pregnant. And again, if the daughter's not showing any symptoms, you know, again, if you look at the research on vertical transmission, what they actually showed is not kids getting Lyme disease as we typically think of it. They actually had more birth defect. Correct. So, you know, what I have seen in some of my kids that makes me suspicious are kids that have developmental delays, neurological impairment. They're not hitting their milestones on time. So I, I don't know how old your daughter is, but if she's been hitting all her milestones and she's got no other unexplained fevers, you know, rashes, things that just don't seem normal, I, I probably wouldn't be terribly concerned. Right. Yeah, and the vertical transmission piece, I mean, the science I know of is like stillborns, unfortunately, you know, yeah. babies that didn't make it have Lyme spirochetes in them. That just means they had the Lyme spirochete. I mean, it's technically not Lyme disease and they didn't confirm, hey, look, two and a, a head developmentally. That's awesome. She's fine. Fabulous. <laughs> don't test. Don't worry about it. Um, and I've had some, you know, kids who appear to have, you know, from DNA evidence of tissue sampling have Lyme and Babesia. And it was how we diagnosed mom with having Babesia because all the other tests were negative. Treated mom. She got better. Baby, you know, never got treated. And the baby's been spectacular. So, I mean, it's, it's about the immune system and such. So it's important, um, you know, and, and the, the transmission, again, the thing we know about is a tick bite. Let's prevent tick bites um, and, and understand that the science is not all that good and it's out and people have to work harder to get the answers for some of these other things. But we don't know at this moment, you know, what these other rates of transmission are. So... Um, what else did we have in there? Oh, uh, Nona mentioned, uh, what, what, what else can Lyme mimic? And cause, <laughs> cause Lyme is called, you know, How syphilis much time do we have. <laughs> yeah. Right. Lyme was the great, or syphilis was the great imitator. We figured out how to treat that. Now we have Lyme, which is another spirochetal illness called the next great imitator. And, I'm going to throw it over to you, Darren, with one additional comment, which is not only is the Lyme the great imitator sort of in my mind, but I also call it the great instigator because I think it breaks a lot of stuff and we go after Lyme when other stuff ends up being the primary cause after that gets screwed up. So what are your thoughts on those questions? Well, certainly for me, anyone that's got any kind of chronic, you know, arthritic and neurological combination of symptoms makes me very suspicious of Lyme or a co-infection. So, you know, things like MS and rheumatoid arthritis and all those autoimmune diseases, uh, you know, in my practice, I've, the overwhelming majority of people that have been diagnosed with MS when I test them do test positive for Lyme. So I do see that correlation. Uh, but I mean, I've seen, you know, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia are big, you know, common sort of nondescript diagnoses that, yes, you might have that collection of symptoms, but it doesn't explain why. So, you know, any of these chronic, mysterious, you know, inflammatory conditions, if you've gone through a litany of tests and everything is like negative, 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 including all the autoimmune blood tests, then, you know, Lyme and co-infections are pretty high on my list. Right. And so Nona just put up another comment here too, to saying that I, I think I read it backwards, but, <laughs> but it says, what other diseases mimic Lyme? And I think that this goes back to something we talked about in the beginning, but what are your feelings on that? 
Well, again, I think, you know, in any of these autoimmune or chronic inflammatory problems, because we have so many diagnoses out there that are really just descriptions. You know, if you look at the, the diagnostic criteria for fibromyalgia, you've got to have whatever 15 out of 19, you know, trigger points when you go push on the muscles. You've got to have, you know, for chronic fatigue, you know, there's a set of criteria, but, you know, none of it says why. You know, why does somebody right. get lupus? Why does somebody get rheumatoid arthritis? Why does someone get, you know, MS? You know, they can tell you the process going on in your body, but they can't tell you the why. And if you dig into the literature, I mean, we have a bunch of evidence, not just Lyme, but Epstein-Barr and Klebsiella and Mycoplasma and Candida can all trigger these inflammatory autoimmune problems. So, you know, again, as we're trying to get to root cause, you right. know, it may very well be that, you know, we're really not just treating the infection, we're really treating this overarching autoimmune problem that encompasses a lot of different things. But, you know, my practice has really evolved over time that, you know, we just don't focus on the bug anymore. Now we you know, we treat the person and we have to deal with all these immune things. And like you said, just a few minutes ago, you know, Lyme kind of creates this wave of destruction in its path. So now we have to clean up the mess of all that stuff that, you know, Lyme has shifted. Right. Well, and it goes back to that, like, you know, the, when we were talking about how Lyme disease has great ability to hide and to go to play, you know, to do things to your body that disrupt it. I mean, not only does it, um, you know, cloak itself from the immune system, you know, it clogs up detox pathways, it hides in places your immune system can't go, you know, it goes to places antibiotics can't go. So, I mean, there's a lot of things going on and, you know, it's interesting. I, I appreciate, uh, you know, Cindy was sharing everything to the pandas pans group to, and, you know, I know we both see a lot of autoimmune encephalitis, particularly infection caused in children. And there was a question, um, you know, uh, earlier on about the use of LDN. And, so, yep. and so I think that that's a good dovetail into some of that as well. Um, yep. So I use a lot of LDN in my practice. Uh, to be honest, I'd say it's about a 50-50 response. Yes, yeah, here. People feel like that it helps their their health in whatever way, whether it's controlling their pain, uh, helping with their immune system, and the other fifty percent really report it doesn't help. I fortunately have not had really any negative reactions. People feel like they got worse. That's pretty uncommon. I've had just a handful of people that tell me they got weird, wonky, vivid dreams after starting low dose naltrexone. But by and large, I find it's pretty well tolerated. It's very inexpensive. And I try it on most of my Lyme patients. We give it two or three months, see if there's any improvement. If not, we ditch it. But I, I think it's worth a shot. Yeah, I, I agree totally. I do the same thing. I mean, it's kind of cool too, because it like, you know, for me, I, I always like getting as close to natural as possible and supporting your own function. And, yeah. you know, it, it works by basically blocking opiate receptors and then it unblocks. And for whatever reason in that low, you know, as you know, in that low sort of blockade, and it just, then your body goes, oh, let's let off endorphins. And so we take it at bedtime to augment our natural endorphin release. So we're actually getting immune modulation and cytokine modulation, you know, by just asking your body to do more of what it's supposed to be doing anyway. So, I mean, I find that that's like um, really good. And, you know, somebody at the Thrill House mentioned LDN turned around their inflammation in a huge way. Um, and, you know, some strange dreams. And I think I have a lot of people who have strange dreams. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> in my in my group of people um but but yeah i mean but it's you know the one thing that's interesting is i i've not you know and thankfully my desk is wood so i can tap on it i haven't seen anybody who's really had nightmares it's mostly just like they get some movies you know and you know there's a couple people mentioning hey it didn't work for me but you know it's worth trying and i agree you know like what what darren is saying is it doesn't work for everybody um you know and typically what I find with LDN is, you know, like Darren was saying, two to three months and, and, and in our more chronic, more complicated people, sometimes they need it for si four or six months. Um, but one, one kind of clinical co sort of pearl is I remember I've had some people where the thing that really made a huge difference for them was diet and LDN. And, and, and it totally turned around their autoimmunity, turned around their tick-borne illness. But the thing that came up that was nuts was they're like, I think it was just the diet. So they ditched the LDN and everything fell apart. <laughs> yeah. And then they well, went on the LDN for like another year and stayed on the diet for, they'd only done it for like six months. So they go back on full bore, right diet, right LDN for a year. Then they were able to get rid of the LDN and they were able to manage it with diet. So, yeah. you know, there's different ways to use it. 
Yeah, well, I said I like the fact that it's really inexpensive. I mean, the pharmacy we use here in California, three months is forty-five bucks. Uh, whether you're on one milligram or six milligrams, there's no right, difference. Right. So, you know, again, it's affordable for people and you get, you at least got a 50, 50 shot of it doing something positive for you. Right. Let's see. Uh, all kinds of stuff. Dysautonomia caused by Lyme or is it a standalone or, and may Lyme exacerbate it? Yes. <laughs> the doctor said it might be separate. I don't know. Dysautonomia and Lyme. Uh, I find them pretty common, uh, mostly in my women Lyme patients, for whatever reason. I see it far more in women than I do men. I don't know why. Uh, but I have seen people that after they get Lyme, again, I think it probably speaks to some level of neural inflammation and how it's affecting the autonomic nervous system. Beyond that, I don't really know what the mechanism is. But I have seen people who were really fine prior to Lyme. And afterwards, they start getting, you know, POTS. They start getting other types of dysautonomic, you know, dysfunction. And... Yeah, I think it's Lyme related. Yeah. Um, just a quick add on for somebody. LDN is low dose naltrexone. And maybe somebody else can type that in for me because I don't want to mess with my IG screen since I screwed it up before. You know, the other thing, too, about the tick-borne stuff is you got to, you know, remember that the, the, the POTS autonomic regulation has a lot of different mechanisms. And one of the pieces that people don't really understand is the the influence of the vagus nerve on the heart so so there's a nerve that does the you know a lot of us know about the sympathetic fight or flight mechanism and then the parasympathetic is healing and rejuvenating and stuff like that and digesting our food and sleeping well the parasympathetic allows us to keep our heart rate at a you know it bring the level down um, and it also allows us to digest our food and keep our gut working properly and that comes out on the back of the head here in the neck. So all of us with our head forward posture, our screen with our vagus, a lot of us get locked. There's a thing called polyvagal theory where they talk about different functional pieces of the vagus. And the part that goes to the heart is the part that usually gets screwed up when you have Lyme or other chronic illnesses. So we lose some of the regulatory ability from a functional perspective, um, you know, over this. And so there's a lot of these help self-help things and, for anybody who wants to stick around to the end, I'll be sharing some resources that you can pick up that'll help you do some of these exercises at home to work on that. And it really can help change your POTS like response, you know, but the other part is babesiosis is, is well known to cause dysautonomia and dysregulation of your brain's ability to modulate the automatic, you know, systems in the body. And certainly Lyme and Bartonella have been found in brain tissue and they can kind of do those same things. So, I mean, I think that's an important thing to consider that I, I see a lot of dysautonomia. Now, the question I think as it was posed is great. Is it like, you know, you had autonomic dysregulation and then you got Lyme and they just made, and, and Lyme just made it worse or co-infection made it worse. Or was it like the Lyme and co-infection caused it? And if you treat the Lyme and co-infection, it goes away or, did you have Lyme co-infection trigger something you already had and now you get rid of Lyme and co-infection, but this is turned on and you have to do something else still. And I've seen all three of those scenarios play out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I think it's, it can go any, any, any of those directions, as you mentioned, I I've seen the same thing where there's evidence prior to Lyme that they had some element of autonomic dysfunction, although very mild, you know, maybe they're just a little, you know, hypotensive, their blood pressure always runs low you know, they get a little lightheaded when they stand up too quickly. Uh, and then, you know, they get Lyme and it kind of, it's like gas on the fire. And then I have other patients I said who are perfectly fine. And then after Lyme, they start kind of breaking down. So uh, I'm sure it can go in both directions. And that's been my clinical observation as well. Cool. So there's a question from Candace about what causes brain inflammation. And I think that this, um, is kind of a, an important place where we can start talking and dovetail into a lot of the work that I know we both do and you've written about in your book. I think it's really important for us to take a few, um, mo you know, actually more than a few, a lot of moments and, and talk about like what gets the brain going, what are the parts of the body that we can work on to help get inflammation in the brain down. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't think, and again, when you look at the, the literature, uh, it's probably not one mechanism. It's a combination of different things that are happening. 
We do know that there are very specific proteins in the brain that get targeted as part of the autoimmune response to Lyme. So as your immune system is trying to fight the Lyme organism, it accidentally starts cross-reacting with different proteins in our brain and our, our nerves. So that's probably some element of the neural inflammation. We also know that there's a secondary method through the gut, that you know the gut-brain connection is very intimate, that people who have you know, chronic gastrointestinal problems can also be more prone to having brain inflammation. A lot of that's actually probably modulated through mast cells. Uh, there's a Dr. Theo Theoretis, uh, his website's mastbellmaster.com. He's a, an MD, PhD professor at Tufts University, and he's done a lot of research on mast cell activation in the brain specifically. And what he found in his research is that when people get reactive, they don't necessarily get hay fever, or what we kind of think of, you know, systemic mast cell activation. It can be very localized to the brain, and therefore you can get mood changes, behavior changes. I think this kind of also speaks to why a lot of people get neuropsychiatric symptoms with Lyme. It's that that chemical reaction in the brain, and it really has nothing to do with serotonin. Uh, it's probably more related to histamine and some of these other chemicals. So I think that combination of you know autoimmunity against you know brain tissue, activation of internal chemicals within the central nervous system that are creating inflammation, you know that combination just sort of leads to the different symptoms. And depending on what part of the brain gets affected, you know that's what people experience. Right. And, you know, what's interesting to me, too, is like I remember a couple of years ago lecturing at iLabs and I was talking in the fundamentals course and I was going to do my brain detox lecture a couple of days later. And I'm like talking about Bartonella. And I realized that one of the that some of the cells that function like the immune system in the brain, the microglia, Bartonella goes into your brain and can be found inside the cells that are supposed to kill the kill it. Yeah. So both I've, I've seen re, uh, literature showing that Lyme and Bartonella can hide in the immune cells that are supposed to get it. And Bartonella specifically in brain cells, you know. Um, and then if you look at like pandas and people are thinking about brain inflammation with pandas um, and they're saying, so for anybody who's not familiar, you know, it's like pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome or disorder after streptococcal infection. <laughs> Yeah. which is why we call it pandas. And, you know, any kind of infection induced autoimmune encephalitis, we might cause pans or, um, and people just throw out pandas, even though that's specific for strep. But the bottom line is in the strep induced brain inflammation, people have studied in your nose that you get inflammation, or I should say, when you have strep there, you have your own TH17 cells. So your own immune cells, T helper cells, that go after strep and that's fine once or twice but if you get recurrent infection you have um in the nasal lymphatic tissue you just have congregation of all these immune cells that are your own cells that are primed for strep but then they can um travel back up the nervous smell into the brain and break down the blood brain barrier um cause cross-reactive uh, antibodies inflammation but you know cause inflammation of these microglia i just mentioned and these are your, and this is all in the absence of any true infection. So right. this is your own immune cells just causing an autoimmune sort of process where your body's gone haywire causing brain inflammation. And then I, you know, the important part too is one of the primary ways of detoxifying sort of the dirty water, if you will, from around the brain and getting all the, the junk out is through the nervous smell. You know, the lymphatics that are around the nasal um, the olfactory nerve, which is that nervous smell. And people estimate that's 15 to 30% of brain detox. But then I went back and a lot of the cranial nerves um, as they exit the skull actually have this, lymph this lymphatic fluid draining from the brain there. And so it's really important that that nasal passage works well, that we have a good posture with our neck. The other thing that's kind of scary that a lot of people like Darren and I are dealing with are mold toxicity issues. Oh, and wow. we found things like, you know, naso sinus biofilms, all right? Well, the problem is, and even just make it even more simple. What about somebody with chronic sinusitis? I just told you like up to 30% of the detoxification of your brain is in your nose. So if you walk around all day like this, I mean, you're, <laughs> you're behind the eight ball and you're building yeah. up these toxins leading the inflammation in the brain as well. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I had a chance to talk with uh, Dr. Stephen Fry, and he runs his own lab called Fry Labs. And right. one of the things that's really interesting about what he's doing is he developed a special oh. staining technique where they are looking at blood. And again, I, you know, when I was in microbiologist, I was always trained that blood is sterile. Anything in the blood, if it's there, it's septicemia. These people need to be in hospital. They probably got one foot in the grave. And he's been showing in his research that the blood is not sterile at all. 
that there's actually a lot of microbes that do pass through without necessarily stimulating this big immune response. But one of the things that he's been finding in his Lyme patients specifically is a heavy, heavy biofilm in the blood itself. Mm -hmm. And he's finding this very unique kind of fungus. And so I, I just think it's, 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 it's can't really kind of interesting that if we talk about, you know, our, our brain and inflammation, I can imagine, well, if it's in the blood, you know, how much of this is accumulating in the small capillary beds? Because this is where kind of the log jam of our bloodstream occurs. And, you know, does that, you know, sort of microaccumulate in these small blood vessels, plugging it up, creating more localized inflammation? We know when your capillary beds, you know, get inflamed, they start to leak. You know, take your hand and whack it against the doorknob and you'll see what happens. If that thing's happening internally, you know, that right. leakage, you know, creates its own set of local inflammation. And if that persists on and on and on, again, I can see that as another mechanism by which you would have this chronic, you know, inflammatory reaction with very little way to help, you know, sort of detoxify it. Um, but as you, as you mentioned about the sinuses, it just made me think of that, that little tidbit. And yeah, interestingly, yeah. Dr. Fry's comment is that he's now been recommending that you go more aggressively after the biofilm and the fungus to sort of, again, potentially get to the root cause. And so far I have one patient I've started on this specific protocol and he tried everything under the sun for Lyme and really didn't respond well with antibiotics and herbs and all the things we normally do. And he's actually been doing really, really well on this protocol. So kind of interesting, I'll keep you posted on it. Yeah, I, you know, and I think it's, it's I, I get these questions like a lot too about what about this thing and what about that thing? And there's so many sort of like, aha moments for certain patients where one thing worked for them finally. Yep. But part of it is what is that path of years or months or years of treatment that led up to that happening? You know, just like if you spend, you know, most of your life keeping yourself super healthy and your guts in check, maybe you're going to handle the treatments of Lyme better than maybe somebody else. So, um, and certainly there's a shout out to Terry Walls and the Walls protocol, which is sort of like a modified paleo uh, keto type of protocol. And certainly um, Terry eats nine plus servings of fruits and vegetables a day, which is some ungodly amount, like 18 cups, which, you know, go Terry and it works, you know, yeah. um, there, and, and part of the place I wanted to go with this thing too, Darren, is like, I think it's important for us to talk about the gut and stuff, but um, Kim had a, uh, and Melissa both had some interesting questions. I think that kind of go along with this. And Kim asked like, you know, so what, what comes first, chicken or the egg, you know, lime or pandas, um, or, you know, low immune system function. And then Melissa's talking about can chronic um, sort of motor tics and, and stereotypic movements be a symptom of, of a child diagnosed with Lyme. And so if we're going to lump this into sort of infection caused autoimmune encephalitis and, yeah. and just call it PANS, so I don't have to keep saying that, um, or PANDAS, whatever, or AE, um, you know, sort of what what do you think comes first, the, the, the autoimmune encephalitis or from an infection or low immune system function? And then what symptoms might you see associated with that? Uh, well, it's always the chicken. <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting, again, having worked with a lot of kids, specifically with autism, where we see a lot of pans, uh, I think, you know, again, I've seen kids, that, as far as I can tell, prior to their exposure, had a healthy immune system. These were not kids who got frequent ear infections, sinus infections, bronchitis. So as far as we can tell, their immune system seemed to be functioning fine. I think it is an issue that the certain microbes have that capacity to trigger autoimmunity. Uh, and in my population, I find Lyme is a much bigger trigger of PANS than strep is. Oh yeah. Uh, when I've treated the Lyme more specifically, I get better results often than when I treat PANS. But I've seen sometimes for some people it's mycoplasma, sometimes it's candida, sometimes it's clostridia. So you can you really have to do the investigative work to figure out what that trigger is for people. But uh, Lyme is hands down the one that's more common, at least in my population. Right. You know, and in and in my population, I'd say it's the same. And I think mycoplasma's got to be in there. Candida's got to be in there. Other things that are really interesting, I've seen kids with mycotoxin exposure who have really, really nasty autoimmune encephalitis because, again, it's it's a fungus. It's just like candida. You know, it can trigger it. And talk about stereotypical movements. I've, I've had kids with vocal tics and motor tics and yep. neck shaking tics. I saw somebody today. Um, you know, there's people who um, will 
go to school in, an ex, in, in a moldy school building and come home and, you know, by Wednesday and Thursday, all they do after they get home from school is lay in their bed and just kind of do these, you know, almost chore uh, choreographed, you know, movements where they're yeah. just writhing for hours until they pass out. And, you know, and so it, it can be really tough. The other thing, though, too, is Bartonella henslei seems to trigger a lot of autoimmune encephalitis. Yep. And I would say that in a lot of cases, I would suggest that Bartonella may be one of the things, few things out there that can look like an autoimmune encephalitis and not actually be it. Meaning, like, I start a treatment for Bartonella and everything goes away in, like, two weeks. I mean, which, <laughs> I'm not saying we're done in two weeks. I'm just saying, yeah. like, a lot of those symptoms just clear right up. And and it's complicated, you know. I mean, it's it, 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 it none of these things are really all that straightforward because we've got that immune system dysregulation going on. And so I think of it in three ways. One is if we look at infection-induced autoimmune encephalitis, we have we have to treat the underlying cause. And usually, um, I, I borrowed that term from Charles Ray Jones, but I would call it toxin-induced autoimmune encephalitis. So we yeah. have the toxic exposure that we need to address. We have the autoimmunity that we need to calm down, and then we have the brain on fire, right? Because a lot of times what will happen is somebody would get a pandas type of thing or pans, and they're like, oh, you know, and then their kid goes to school, and they get exposed to a cold that's not strep or not Lyme, but they're like, oh, my God, they, my, their pandas is worse. I'm like, well, you know, but, but they come in saying it's like the strep or the Lyme that's worse. And I'm saying, well, no, the autoimmune encephalitis got worse because they had another inflammatory slash toxic insult, but it's not always the same thing. And so the problem is, in my experience, once we trigger somebody, more and they get more in, easily triggered by more and more different insults, you know, and that's where school is necessary. Socially, it's necessary to learn and grow, but it's also a Petri dish, you know, an incubator sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I think with PANS, you know, you, again, you just got to really do the detective work. And it's funny, I listened to Sue Sueto speak last year at a conference I was at, and she's the researcher at the NIH that really kind of coined PANS. And right. she basically sat down and told us all testing is worthless. So we all sit there in disbelief and kind of shook our heads and go, okay. Um, you know, here's like, well, you just, you just treat people. I'm like, great. Well, we like to know what we're treating. So in my world, I still test. I still think there's value for me because we do a specific kind of immunotherapy that is specific to the organism that we're treating. There is value of knowing whether it's Lyme or Bartonella or Babesia or whatever it is. Uh, I think, you know, for practitioners who really just, you just use antibiotics and they don't necessarily know what they're treating, maybe it doesn't make a difference much, but uh, I, I find it beneficial to try and hone in and figure out what organisms the trigger. Yeah, I love to find the trigger too, Darren. I mean, I think it's one of these things where it, I, I'm looking at it and when I do use antibiotics, if I know what I'm treating, I can make a really tight package of treatment. You know, like if you have Lyme, Babesia, and Bartonella and strep, man, I can nail that with like almost nothing. But if I don't know, I'm like, try this, try this, try this. I want to be as specific as possible. And, and I think that a lot of, I mean, I think there's a sense out there in the, in the healthcare sort of provider community that we're just, like people who treat Lyme with antibiotics, are just throwing shit and seeing what sticks on the wall. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to narrow it down, whether it's meds, whether it's herbs, whatever. And we really need to, you know, get that taken care of, you know, as specific as we can be, because it makes a huge difference in, you know, efficacy of treatment, duration of treatment, and then also just, you know, not exposing people to more side effects than they potentially need. Yeah. Um, so, dude, everybody, I got to say thanks. There are like a gazillion questions <laughs> coming in. Um, and um, yeah, it, it's kind of tough to, to follow, you know, to get to everybody, but we'll do our best. And I know that some of the testing questions we, um, are, we already hit on before. Um, so, uh, Tom, I, I saw it was an older question, but I think it's really important. Uh, Pamela uh, asks, uh, if you don't know when you were bitten, but did take doxy, is that a cure? Still not well, but told will not know due to Lyme or some other illness. Wow. And I think this is a common problem. People who get exposed and whether they know they have Lyme or suspected Lyme, they're told, well, take your 10 to 21 days of doxycycline and it doesn't matter how you feel at the end of that, you're done. Right. Well, I have some strong opinions on that, but um, 
<laughs> having having had Lyme and been told that, and then I got treated for 10 days, four of which I laid on the floor, alternating shets, sweats and chills. And eight years later, found out that was, that was my undiagnosed, untested, uncared about babesiosis. Um, and I still had Lyme positive, very positive, like eight years later and took me almost five years to get bet well. I mean, that sucks. That's like 13 years, guys. And I'm, I mean, that's like most of my adult life until I started being a Lyme doctor. So, um, you know, um, it, it's interesting. If you look at, I, I always go back and that's great that I had an experience. It's great that, you know, Darren has experience. It's great that all these other practitioners have clinical experience or personal experience. But let's go to the science whenever it's available, right? And so let's look at Monica Embers out of Tulane University. And she did some studies on monkeys, right? So she took rhesus macaque monkeys, infected them for four months. And one group of them, she, she treated for one month of doxycycline, 28 days. And um, their blood test, you know, predominantly became negative. And then, but then they sacrificed the animal and studied their tissue and they found viable Lyme disease in 100% of them. So to say that a different way, that's a 0% cure rate after a month of antibiotics. Then they took another group of monkeys and they treated them with a month of IV ceftriaxone and then two months of oral doxycycline. And yes, we did cure a few, a whopping 27%. So three months of treatment, including a month of IV, cured 27%. And then when you look at another study, she infected them for, you know, uh, yeah, another four months. And then they treated them for four weeks at Doxy and they just followed antibodies and then DNA tests and Xeno diagnosis over the course of the this study for like 10 more months. And what's interesting is if I track these antibody levels, some go up, some go down, some go down, some go up. It's like all over the place. Some never become positive. And they're testing multiple different antibodies of Lyme on multiple different animals. And there's no consistent pattern. There's literally like no one knows. But what happens is in the end, they all have Lyme disease still. So four weeks cures zero, not like one or monkey zero, and it's been repeated. So, uh, you know, again, we don't know what happens from time zero to time um, four months because they've infected the monkeys for four months before we treat them. But if you think about it, most people who come in with a rash and symptoms are two to four to six weeks out from their bite anyway. Right. Um, the only science we have that really is hard science that's good, as we talked about earlier, is if you inject Lyme or Lyme and, and, and a plasma into a mouse, that mouse, if you give them a 19-day long-acting doxycycline injection, will 100% not get Lyme, but that's because they're doing it right away. Right. So we need more studies somewhere in the in-between, but if you've had it for four months, and, you know, and for me, the other problem too, um, is that I got treated, I had a rash, it covered like a fifth of my body, I had all this pain, they found me staring at a wall drooling on myself, and they said, you gotta go to the doctor, you know? Um, and, and you know, so, but I got treated for 10 days. You know, so the problem is, what does 10, what does too short a treatment do? I know I still had symptoms, and everybody said you had chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and all this other crap, but what about our testing, right? I mean, we do know that in the people who did the, the double dose of doxyprophylaxis, we prevented some people from actually having a positive blood test and they still had Lyme. So I don't know what 10 days does because everybody's arguing so that they can have their, you know, their paper published or whatever. And, you know, but, but what we need to do is really focus on getting better studies you know, in, you know, maybe the animal model and then people of what is the right treatment. And, you know, it's interesting is some of the studies that were done on post Lyme syndrome that came out of Johns Hopkins, it was showing that chronic post -Lyme, uh, post treatment Lyme disease syndrome is a real thing that people are not making up. Right. And I think that's good to say that, that Progress. people are not. However, the reason that they found, they, they said they found no evidence of viable um, infection, but they did like two-tier testing and like DNA, like it's, it's, it's like negative, man. Yeah. I mean, we already talked, the, the two-tier test is a 50-50. So it's tough. So anyway, it's yeah. my soapbox, but I mean, <laughs> I think it's a long-winded way of saying that like short courses of treatment, we don't know if they're really doing it and they might be making our, our tests not positive. 
Uh, what else have we got in here that we need uh, to answer, Darren? Uh, Gabriella. Oh, Gabriella. Hi, Gabriella. If you're still on, uh, you said uh, Dr. McCandless said that if kids with autism with leaky guts, uh, yes, they all have leaky guts pretty much. They react badly to low dose naltrexone if they're not gluten casein free because of opioid issues. What are my thoughts? You know, I've uh, that's not been my experience. I mean, pretty much all the kids I see are on a gluten casein free diet anyway for various reasons. Um, again, even uh, kids on the spectrum although they're mostly on that diet, I've not seen really negative reactions to low dose naltrexone. Um, I've actually been pretty happy with it and find it's tolerated pretty well. So um, I- my, That's been my experience. experience. And I have to tell you in my practice, it's, you know, I have a lot of kids with pandas who one of their main symptoms is food refusal and avoidance. So, I mean, I'm probably the only doctor who will ever admit openly that I condoned eating um, fast food in my office but it was a person who hadn't eaten anything but in shore and a piece of bread a day for 10 months. So I was pretty happy. Uh, and eventually hopefully we'll get them on <laughs> a gluten free diet or something like that. But I, I have a lot of people who stay on sort of standard diets. I try to clean them up and, but a lot of them have casein and dairy and, you know, gluten in their diet. And I've seen LDN not be an issue. I mean, and, and you know, I've also seen kids with tick borne illness, as well as mycotoxin illness and adults too, I should say, where where their leaky gut is from their infection, not yeah. from something beforehand. And I've seen leaky gut and food allergies go away with antibiotic treatment. You know, I'm not suggesting that you should go, you know, everybody with food intolerance needs to get antibiotics. I'm just saying in the right person, you know, we do know that Lyme, Babesia, Bartonella can be mycoplasma, can be biopsied out of the gut wall. Right? right. And and so it is possible that infection is causing it. We know that mold mycotoxins, you know, the toxins from mold actually in really, really low levels can actually be, be bactericidal to the good bacteria in your gut. And so like you were talking there about doxy being bacteriostatic. I mean, mold toxins are stronger killing agents against your good bacteria than doxycycline is against Lyme. <laughs> Where do we need to focus? Yeah. It's in our gut. Right. And our so. <laughs> Oh, there, Tammy was mentioning a, a guy by the name of uh, Nori Inishi in Morris, uh, Mount Morris, PA at Blackwater Osteopathic Clinic. And I just got to give Nori a shout out because he's a good friend of mine. He came to our, um, you know, first ever integrative Lyme ski retreat in Utah this year. We're going to be doing it again next year for, um, you know, practitioners. And this is a great excuse for healthcare providers to come sort of have community and, and, and go out and do some extreme skiing and then come back in, have a hot tub and then do some hyperbaric treatments and then dive into learning about Lyme and mold toxicity. So Nori is a good guy. Um, and I love skiing with him. <laughs> so Darren, what we did have a question a long time ago, uh, and I want to circle back to a couple, um, cause like I said earlier, these are phenomenal questions, but hyperbaric and Lyme hyperbaric in general. Yeah. Um, since, so, you know, I had a chance to uh, study with Paul Harch, who I would argue is probably one of the most knowledgeable practitioners on uh, Dr. Harch is at L Louisiana State University, and he's actually published a lot of research. He's worked with the military, uh, so he's done a lot of government work and very high quality research. And what's really interesting uh, is that at low pressure and hyperbarics, you get this really nice anti-inflammatory effect. So my feeling is for particularly the Lyme patients where their primary problem is neural inflammation, probably works better than people that you know suffer more from just arthritis or other types of Lyme symptoms. But for that neural inflammation, uh, I've seen low pressure hyperbaric oxygen actually be very beneficial. So what's low pressure? If you guys have ever done hyperbaric, it can be anywhere from probably 1.2 up to you know 2.5 or three atmospheres. And you know, what the research shows is like you know, 1.3 to 1.5 with an oxygen concentrator is actually very effective at reducing mm -hmm. inflammation. So that's equivalent to diving down to I think about eight feet in water. It's not that, that much. So you, know, you can do it with a hard chamber, you can do it with a soft chamber. A lot of people like to do the soft chamber just because it's easier and if you want, you can spend the money and buy your own chamber and do it at home. It's actually very safe. You don't have the risk of the chamber exploding on you. Uh, when you're in a hard chamber because they pump oxygen in it, you have to be careful about flame and you know igniting. Uh, but in a soft chamber, that doesn't really happen. So uh, you can go in with your iPad, iPhone and hang out for an hour while you get your treatment. So uh, again, I've been advocating more and more after having studied with Dr. Harch 
and for my patients who have access to it and can do it, uh, most of them report that they feel beneficial. So out of all the oxidative therapies out there, uh, I'm not as big of a fan of ozone therapy. I think it's horribly expensive. And mm -hmm. the number of people I've seen who really benefit, it's less than 10%. Uh, it's, so given the cost versus the benefit, I think you get a lot more bang for the buck for something like hyperbaric oxygen. So if it's yeah. accessible and available, I would definitely look into it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, anybody who's in our Empowered by Lyme support group, I've done Facebook Lives from within inside there talking about it. You know, I actually, you know, had a couple of good days over the weekend climbing with the family at the rock gym and I, I torched myself and last night I was dying. So I hopped in the chamber and it really worked. So, I mean, I, I really like it. You know, it's interesting. I and mean, you look at the work that came, that's come out of Europe and Dr. Harch's work and some of the stuff shows the changes in, in um, toxic, you know, metabolites in the brain and uh, like in as little as 10 one hour sessions at 1.3 atmospheres. So it's, it's great for detox. And then, you know, um, the other part is that Dr. Harch's work is like, well, I think it all started. It's like, you know, a lot of people are doing 2.3 or three atmospheres and they needed to do, find out if hyperbaric worked. So they did sham, right? They need a sham to figure, to compare it to. So the sham was what we would call mild hyperbaric, yeah. which is 1.3 atmospheres or less. And so they're like, okay. And what they found was both worked. So the conclusion wasn't that they both worked. The conclusion was the, the higher pressure didn't work because the, it didn't, it wasn't statistically different than the placebo. Yeah. But what happened was the placebo was good. Both of them were better than nothing. Yeah. And so Dr. Hart even published a lady who had 40 sessions of an hour ish each at 1.15 atmospheres, which is like two pounds per square inch. It's almost nothing. You barely even start to notice that there's any pressure on you. And there were, there were massive changes in, in her Alzheimer's, both functionality was like a moderate improvement, but then six to 38% improvement in metabolism, in different parts of her brain. Yeah. Um, what, it, what I, I have my thoughts on frequency, but somebody, uh, it looks like Carolyn here is asking about frequency of hyperbaric and, and I'm going to add in duration of it. Like, so, in, like uh, depending on who you talk to, and I think depending on what you have access to, uh, Dr. Harch in his clinic, I know when he people come in for a lot of conditions, he actually has you do it twice a day. Uh, so you go in in the morning and do a session for about an hour and then you do another hour session. Sometimes it's up to an hour and a half. And I think he even reported in some cases, even two hours. So he'll have yeah, people four hours in between. Right. With, yeah, at least the, that break in between. Uh, and then you do that for, I think he does it for two weeks uh, at that schedule. And then you start to taper off thereafter. So for people who have their own chamber and obviously can do it as often as they want, I mean, you could go in every day if you wanted and do it. You're not going to overdo it uh, with hyperbaric. There's no really such thing as far as I'm aware of, of overdosing. Right, so right. If you've got the time and you can go hang out in the chamber for an hour or so, uh, you will probably get the most benefit out of it. I don't think it's as beneficial when you just go once in a blue moon. You're no. probably not going to see any improvement from it. So unless you can commit to doing it on probably uh, at least five days a week for a handful of weeks, Right. Um, I've seen, um, you know, I've seen changes with 10 treatments, like in the literature, most people are doing 40, yeah. you know, with those twice a day gigs and what's in, and, um, I know some people like for me, I'll go in once in a while because it's, I'm using it for like recovery from athletics, kind of like a lot of the NBA and the NFL players. A lot of people are using it just, be, you know, for recovery, but when you're in a chronic recovery state, you, you definitely typically, you know, need to do it a bit longer, but yeah. um, it's pretty good. And the nice thing about the home chambers and the office chambers that most of us are using is like you were saying, Darren, you can poke a hole in the thing. And I mean, you're not going to have the worst case scenario is your eardrums pop outside yeah. of that. You're not going to get nitrogen, which is called the bends and all those kind of problems. Yeah. So um, it's important stuff. Um, I see that our, our, my buddy, Tyler Lewis here, who I'm sure, you know, too, is popped on. Hey, Tyler. Um, a good shout out to her. Um, so there's a question um, uh, from Juliana about does everyone with Lyme and co-infections get reactivated Epstein-Barr? <laughs> well, uh, depending on if you read medical medium. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, look at, consider that, you know, 80% of the people out there, adults anyway, have exposure to Epstein-Barr. 
So Epstein-Barr is a normal virus that most people get exposed to. I think it's very hard sometimes to know about whether Epstein-Barr has really been reactivated or if it's something normal. You know, one of the most common scenarios I see is someone comes in with their labs, their doctor drew every virus, bacteria under the sun. So they tested for Epstein-Barr, herpes 6, and CMV, and you know, everything else. And they've got these sky high IgG titers to everything. And they go, oh my gosh, I've got this horrible reactivation of all these viruses. Well, there's a, a concept in immunology called uh, polyclonal activation. And basically what it is, is that when your immune system gets activated to one thing, it kind of gets activated to everything. So imagine yeah. just having this very broad stimulation of your immune system. But when you're measuring IgG antibodies, because your entire immune system's geared up, then all these IgG titers end up being high. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're having activation of that particular virus. It could just very well be that you're having immune activation overall. So with Epstein-Barr specifically on blood tests, if I see you know early antigen or IgM positive, I think that's a better marker that there might actually be activation and then we'll kind of treat it appropriately. But when you just see these high IgG titers by itself, uh, I think it's a little bit harder to make that jump. Yeah, absolutely right on. Um, you know, uh, there were some questions that I wrote down from earlier on I wanted to circle back to because I think they're important. And it has to do with anxiety and depression and then certain treatments. And, you know, things to think about is, and, and I'll be interested to hear what your experiences are, Darren, but like if you have somebody with like pretty significant depression and pretty significant anxiety, that could be in relationship to if if it's caused primarily by tick-borne illness. Now, there are a lot of other causes. If you're chronically sick, you you could certainly become depressed just about being chronically sick and stuff like that. But just like, you know, kind of understanding that this isn't all depression and all anxiety, but, you yeah. know, um, you know, anxiety and depression that are pretty moderate to severe could be related to babesiosis if it's kind of the new onset stuff. Lower, you know, levels of anxiety and depression can be seen in Bartonella, but what we see more in Bartonella is like the rage OCD, the acute onset of ticks, very much like the autoimmune encephalitis type things. And so I just think that that's important. And I mean, the other part is the, the immune dysregulation and the gut dysregulation and sort of the screwing up the vagus nerve and the communication of the heart all lead into that too. But um, so what's your experience been in terms of anxiety and depression with, with Lyme and, and, you know, treatments and specifically there is a question about CBD in there as well. Yeah. Well, again, I, I think it's about treating the whole person because we know that depression, anxiety are characteristics of Lyme and a lot of these co-infections. Again, it's about the overall approach. I mean, I generally try to avoid medication if at all possible because right. again, I don't think it's really addressing the underlying cause. But again, you got to treat everybody where they're at. And if I have someone who's suicidal and we need you know, medicine to stabilize them until we can get to the root, that, that's fine. Again, I think we have a lot of natural products that can help, uh, particularly for anxiety uh, or depression. You know, we got things like 5-hydroxytryptophan or s methionine, which can help with depression. Uh, L-theanine, which comes from the green tea plants, really good for anxiety. We have a Are there lot any chance that those first two have uh, acronyms that people might know more, be more commonly familiar with? Uh, like 5-HTP? <laughs> yes. Or SAMe? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think people might have heard of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love hanging out with like molecular biology geek people. <laughs> So awesome. I, again, you know, there's a lot of natural products that can be used to help stave it off. I think again, as you're working through, you know, the whole person, you're talking about their diet, you're talking about improving their gut health, you're treating the active infection, you know, you're dealing with all this other stuff. I find as we deal with all that, a lot of these symptoms do improve. But again, for someone, particularly if it's really severe, you know, you, you kind of have to use what you have to use. Uh, you do use a lot of CBD oil in my practice. Again, I find it clinically effective in most of the patients I use it with. With CBD oil, it is very much a function of dose. Oh my God, yeah. And I'm amazed at some how high a dose some people need based on their size. So I tend to start small anyway, but you know, if we find that there's not really a lot of clinical improvement, I really have no problem of increasing the dose. You know, for most people, if they get too much CBD, and I am talking about just CBD. I mean, I am in California where, you know, medical mar or marijuana is recreational, but I'm talking about right. using the pure CBD product that does not have THC in it, or at least less than 0.03%. Uh, 
Uh, and the CBD oil by itself, again, can be very effective at modulating anxiety, sleep problems. Uh, you know, we know that CBD oil is anti-inflammatory. Uh, it tends to be expensive when you get it to the higher doses. Um, Mellow Candles asking, what CB brands do you like? Uh, I've used mostly CV Sciences. The company's called Canavest. I like them only because a, their product is the basis of a lot of research. They actually provide the raw material for research done around the world. So I know right. the product works. Uh, but there's a lot of really good players uh, out there. I just started with a new company, and I'm sorry, they're brand new, or I literally don't even know their name yet. They're based out of Ohio. Uh, but the rep who used to work for Cannabis now works for this company, and their price point's a little bit better. So we're going to try them out and see how that goes. Right on. Yeah, I mean, I've had some good success with Bluebird Botanicals. I mean, they've been around for a while. I mean, kind of basic stuff, but, you know, um, you know, and, and Kim Marie made a comment that, you know, pathogens deplete us of nutrients and that create, you know, healthy neurotransmitters as well as CBD could de deplete things, you know, things like potassium. But, you know, I mean, I think the thing is um, in these situations, every, everything we do has the potential to imbalance something else if we just do it in isolation or we just say CBD is the treatment for anxiety and, you know, and pain or something. And we just use large doses without figuring out really what needs to happen. Um, and I think that um, I keep, I, I think I've said this is like the third or fourth time I said this. I want to talk about diet and, and modulation of the immune system because there's questions about IVAG. And I think, you know, we've talked about using LDN maybe in place of IVAG. Certainly, I think there's a, a role for IVAG in certain patients. But, you know, th there's this point where we have to remember that you guys are all in charge of your own health. Like, Darren takes care, is responsible for himself. I'm responsible for myself and providing the raw materials to do, for our bodies to function as best as they can under the given circumstances. You know, it's like none of us walk out in the field and go, hey, I want to get bitten by a lime. But you can say, hey, or buy a deer tick and get lime. But you can certainly say, I'm going to choose to eat a healthy diet today and every day from here forward so that you know, whatever I have in my body, I'm going to make my body so healthy. It's going to be inhospitable for anything bad to live. So. Preach it, brother. Yeah. <laughs> what are your thoughts on diet, though? Because, I mean, I know you wrote like a whole book on it. So. <laughs> Actually, just one chapter. But, yeah. Yeah. You know, diet's huge. And I think it's the one piece that uh, gets overlooked a lot. Sometimes we focus so much on trying to get rid of the bug. We forget about this very foundational part of our health. You know, we know that up to 80% of our immune function comes from the gut. So if the gut isn't functioning well, it's going to be very hard for your immune system to function well. And because of that relationship between your gut microbes, your immune system, uh, a lot of, you know, neurotransmitters like serotonin actually get produced in the gut itself. So it does have an effect on the brain. So that trickle down effect of what happens when the gut's not functioning well uh, is just enormous. And I've had some patients where, you know, before we can't have even really get going on any active treatment, you know, we start making these diet changes and we see this enormous improvement in the way they feel. So I wouldn't underestimate the importance of following a good diet. And again, you know, I kind of talk in my book the difference between you no know, paleo and autoimmune and uh, can anti candida diet. And again, you know, my experience again as a Lyme patient and having used it with you know thousands of Lyme patients in my practice is you know what's it called an alkaline diet. And very simply, it's it's a diet that helps promote better alkalinity in your body. And if you look from a physiological standpoint. With the exception of your skin, your stomach, your bladder, and for women, the vaginal area, which is very acidic to protect against outside invaders, so the rest of your body actually functions in an alkaline state. So the more we eat foods that kind of help promote that alkalinity, that means all the cell functions are working the way they're supposed to, the enzymes and all those processes. As the body becomes more acidic, you know, in essence, it becomes more inflamed. So, you know, this is a really, uh, the one thing that you have 100% control over against what you put in your mouth. And you can choose to put right. things in the heel or hurt you. And I find, again, when people kind of get used to following an alkaline diet, you know, clinically they feel better. And they find that they're not starving. They're not deprived. You know, it's not a diet diet where we're going down to calorie restriction and you're hungry all the time. This is just really about making better food choices that work with your body instead of against it. Well, I think the thing that's interesting, too, is because I, I you know, when I was sick, everybody was just like, oh, you got fibromyalgia, whatever. And I'm like, no, there's something wrong with me. You know, don't give up on me. And 
I didn't, I couldn't turn it. So the things I did was I learned that, you know, you could change your diet. So I made a radical change in my diet and it was far from even being like, you know, a good diet compared to what I know now and what you're talking about. But the reality is that made a huge difference. And then I was, I did yoga an hour and a half a day, six days a week for a year and a half because I physically could do that. And I required that for the other healing, but it was like, I did what I could do to make a difference. And I was like 70% better. I mean, the other 30% sucked. <laughs> it was really hard to get past that part, but, but I did every single thing I could do, you know? Um, and I think the other part that's really important to me is the more and more we look at this, there's such a role of the limbic system, our emotional system and our memories. So how many people that you see complain of brain fog? <laughs> a lot. Right? Most of them. Yeah. Right. And so here's the trick, guys. First thing you need to do is I need to go to bed soon because it's getting late, right? Because I need a good night's sleep so, because my brain detoxifies primarily while I'm sleeping. So go, go at, when we're done, turn off your Wi-Fi. And every night, turn off your Wi-Fi. Put it on like a timer and have it go off so it doesn't interfere with your sleep. Start going to sleep and do work with your practitioners or, you know, to get a good night's sleep. That's going to help you detox your brain. And the other thing is eat really good food because if you're not eating really good food, you're not detoxing your brain, you're causing inflammation. And if you want to have good memories, take care of your gut because your gut feeds back into your brain directly through the vagus nerve. And it, if your gut is off, it will change not only your ability to create new memories, but even recall the memories you've already made. So if you want to fix your brain, you know, brain fog, get some sleep and get some, you know, some good food. The other part is a lot of the, you know, a lot of what goes on in our gut is regulating, like, you know, you were talking about Darren, like serotonin and stuff. I mean, it's all being regulated in our gut and this is how our emotions are. But the important part is going back to the pots and all this other thing is our emotions will regulate our physiology and our physiology will regulate our emotions. So do some of the things that you can do um, to allow yourself to be okay with having chronic Lyme disease and, and having been hand, handed a shit hand of cards, you know. Um, a, a friend of ours by the name of Joan Rosenberg has this book, 90 Seconds to a Life You Love. It is by far like the best resource I've seen for quickly and easily allowing yourself just to recover a little bit of this energy that we waste, creating bad memories, fighting our emotions, and just being able to sit with them. So um, certainly that's been posted on our Facebook page. I'll, I'll stick it in the comments at some point. But, um, you know, look at Darren's book, look at the different ways to modulate the immune system, look at your food, look at, there was a question about Buner herbs. I know you talk about those, Darren. And so, um, and then look at some of the work that we're, that um, we're doing with, you know, the emotional side of things allows you to take your, your personal power back. It allows you to gain your energy back. And just by, you know, there's research on just breathing a couple, you know, five, 10 minutes a day. Well, you know, when you breathe, you calm your central nervous system down. Those autonomics get parasympathetic, and then you're then you're able, you get an immune boost. So if you want to boost your immune system, sleep more, eat better food, and then you know do, focus on your breathing for five to ten minutes twice a day. I mean, I mean, and these are things that you really you know can do at home, and this can help you tonight. And the other part is you know this whole thing about drinking enough water. Unless there's a really, um, uh, you know, rare medical condition, you, 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 you know, that you have, you can handle a little more water and having about 70 ounces of water a day is, is a good thing because the, all the fluid around the brain, most of that's water, all the fluid in your blood, most of that's water, most of your body should be water. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. And by the way, this is your hobby, but I am drinking water. So, <laughs> Yeah, even though it's it's like eight thirty. What is it? No, yeah, seven thirty, huh? It's only seven thirty here. Yeah, oh, lucky dog. Early in the evening. Yeah, um, no coffee for me. I'd be up all night. But it's interesting. It's like you know when we think about our coffee. I mean, you know, it blocks adenosine, and adenosine is supposed to rise throughout the day so that we can go to sleep. And so uh, if it's too high, you know, we take the coffee to knock it down, and we get some energy along with the caffeine and all this stuff. So, you know, and then you know, alcohol, a lot of people get tired with alcohol, right? But it's because it's a ga it, it like, it's a GABA agonist. So it's like, we've got all this GABA going on. And so we fall asleep and then we wake up in the middle of the night because we had alcohol and it 
blocked our natural GABA rise. So it's all these things that we choose to do, do make a difference. And, you know, it's not to say you can't have a drink or have some coffee because, you know, but it's, it's interesting the choices that we can make and that we make at home where we can, you know, gain some power over what we're doing and really take care of ourselves to really augment what we're doing with our docs in their office. Yeah. Well, I think you make a great point about the importance of self-care overall. You know, I think so many of us who've been through Lyme and I certainly went through my phase of being horribly depressed and angry and just not myself. And I think we all suffer from a little bit of PTSD having dealt with Lyme in our own way. So being able to, uh, realize that, you know, we need that element of self-care. And that means, you know, sleeping appropriately, moving our body to the best of our abilities. I mean, I can remember being so exhausted. Literally, I would plop in front of the couch in Connecticut and I would just try and stretch. That's really all I felt like I could do. And it didn't feel like anything. Uh, but over time, I mean, I started walking and walked outdoors and, you know, eventually started studying martial arts. And like eight years later, mm -hmm. I got a black belt in karate. So it took me a long time to get there. It didn't happen overnight. But, you know, the value of, you know, just having that commitment to to uh, do something that helped myself, uh, it's critical. And I think it's different for everybody. So, you know, what worked for me isn't for you. So find the thing that, you know, works for you. I think if it's, you know, meditation, if it's massage, if it's art, if it's music. Uh, gosh, Tom and I were at a, a meeting a couple weeks ago and we had a little jam session and uh, it was, I found it actually extremely therapeutic, you know. <laughs> we were doing it just for fun, but I love music as does Tom and he ripped on the guitar and I played some drums and sang and uh, we had a great time. So again, find those things that you love. I think it's so easy when you're not feeling well, you lose those things in your life that bring you joy. And I think it's important to find the joy in life because it's just so easy to miss. So, you know, find out what it is for you that brings you some joy and happiness and that you can share with others. And uh, it just makes a huge difference in the recovery process. It just makes a huge difference in the recovery process. Yeah, I mean, I think it's so it's so absolutely critical. And, and it, it is that joy, you know, and that we lose a lot of it. And there's all there's so much of I can't do it you know, and I don't have the energy or I'm afraid to yeah. do it. And some of it's true, but there's some part of it that you can do. And you don't want to lose that because what's interesting when you look at the, um, you know, what's called polyvagal theory, where we're looking at the, 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 how the vagus nerve that controls the parasympathetic and the healing goes to our heart and to our gut. The part that goes to our heart has a lot to do with joy and, and our social um, engagement. And one of the problems is we talk about fight or flight as sympathetic and the rest rejuvenation and social joys and, and interacting with people as parasympathetic, but there's another part. So when we think about sympathetic, the fight or flight is I can run away or I can stay and fight and make it. But what if you can't, what if you're stuck? Like if you're a little chipmunk in a cat's mouth, you have to play dead and you get frozen and hopeless and your immune system gets suppressed. You don't feel like you're ever going to get better. You get numb and then you start to socially withdraw. You know, and so it's it, it may sound ridiculous that all these, you know, doctors who are going out like and working all the time or, you know, and trying to, you know, and we're in these groups to find a way to share with you how to get better and how to get our message to more people like you so that they don't have to suffer with chronic Lyme disease or taking time to be in a band. All right. I, I mean, I, I don't I've never been in a band. I, I mean, maybe in sixth grade and fifth grade when I was in playing viola. You know, and I jammed with people on the guitar in college, but it was basically like, but it's this joy of just going out and doing something that we're passionate about. And I think that that's so important um, to really do. Um, and, 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 and it'll help you get from the stuck, hopeless, frozen, numb place to a back where you can do it and where you can heal and you're boosting your immune system, you know, and it's it's tough because I've been lecturing about this in one form or another for years. And I always feel like everybody wants the protocol. How do I get better? And those are important pieces. But the most important piece to me is you have the, the greatest power out there. It's your health. And you actually can change a traumatic amount of it without even, you know, before you even get to one of our offices. And so, you know, it's just, I find that very invigorating. I know it's scary to a lot of people to think that how much responsibility you have for your own health, 
but it's an amazing gift. I mean, you can make small changes that make a big difference. So. Yeah, well, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think there's so much that we can do for ourselves outside of, you know, what you and I are directing people to do. Uh, it just takes a little bit of discipline and it, it, it gets hard. Uh, again, when you're not feeling well, the effort to cook, prepare meals. Uh, again, I, I remember too vividly what it was like and it's, it can be pretty miserable, but I think it's also important to reach out to people around you. Don't be shy, ask for help when you need it. You, you just can't feel bad when you're working to feel well to you know lean on other people to help you get through the process and um, I was fortunate to have a good support of you know family and friends at the time and as much as I kind of you know people would ask me hey Darren how are you feeling nobody really wanted to know the truth and I knew that <laughs> you know I feel like shit today. Aren't you better yet so, Darren? Aren't you better? Uh, yeah but you know I, at least they were you know doing the best that they could to be supportive. And when I needed help with something, you know, they were willing to jump in. So I feel very fortunate in that aspect because I know not everybody who goes through Lyme has that experience, but I think as much as you can, you know, reach out to other people within your comfort level, uh, it's just good, you know, there's strength in numbers. And remember too, there's a whole community of us Lyme people out there. And even if it's online and something like this, you know, get involved, reach out, connect with one of us, even if it's through social media, uh, you know, we want to, help people in every way we can. Uh, so, um, you know, don't be shy about reaching out and asking for help when you need it. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things I, for, you know, it, it's kind of getting pretty late on the East coast. It, I think even with the questions we haven't been able to get to, we could do this all night long. Um, <laughs> so I think we, we should probably have another one sometime soon. One of the things I wanted to throw up, I, I told everybody um, at the beginning, I really wanted to share a little something that I put together. So I'm going to throw that up for just a second. Maybe I'll try to see if I can get our names out of here so it doesn't hit us in the face. Yeah. Anybody who's interested, you know, I just wanted to say thanks. Um, I've, I'll, we'll share some of Darren's resources in a second. But if you head over to originsofhealth.com slash thank you, the number three free gifts, I have a couple things and one's a handout called common reasons treatment fails and how to avoid them. They're simple things that you can apply starting like hopefully tomorrow if you're on the East Coast, maybe tonight if you're on the West Coast, because one of them is sleep. Uh, the second thing is a thing called my uh, is, is my top five brain detox tips. So again, if you're on the East Coast, read that tomorrow because sleep is number one. <laughs> and, um, and then there's another thing called relax and reboot. And they're just some of the exercises um, that I use with my, pa my patients in the clinic and I've personally used and rotate through on a regular basis that help me balance out my nervous system. So I wanna balance the autonomic nervous system, bring that sympathetic fight or flight cortisol response down, naturally boost up my parasympathetics and then get that immune boost. And they're super simple, like you know, five, 10 minutes a day, once or twice, and they're exercises that no matter how sick you are, you can do. And that's probably my favorite piece of resources. I've got some cool pictures of myself and my daughter in there. So anybody who's interested, please head over and grab that. Um, the other thing is, I do know that um, Darren, I, I mentioned in the comments to join your support group, um, but if you could tell people about the name of that and the name of your book and stuff, because I find that your book probably answers a whole bunch of the questions we didn't get to just yet. Sure. Well, the name of my support group is, uh, well, I guess I should, the book, so I can, so this is the book, The Lyme Solution. I know it looks backward on your screen, but that's it. And so the name of the support group is The Lyme Solution Protocols. And uh, like uh, Dr. Tom's uh, Empowered Lyme group, it's same concept. You know, we're just looking for, looking for ways to help support each other. And my group, and I know Tom's group is too, it's, you know, it's all about positive reinforcement, positive things. What are you doing for yourself that's working? What we're not interested in is, woe is me, Lyme sucks. We know Lyme sucks. It's hard enough as it is, you know, but we want a place that people can come, get good and reliable information, get support, help answer the questions, and not have to scour the internet to try and figure out what's true, what's not true. So uh, hopefully you'll join both of our groups and uh, we'll be happy to help you guys move forward. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think the whole purpose of the groups is to give you guys a place to be real, but then be held, at least in our group, to be held accountable for having that your, your mindset be on healing. 
you know, it doesn't mean you don't have bad days. It's just that there are these days where we need to do it. And, you know, the brain is amazing. When you look at what the brain can do, it's absolutely incredible. Even an infected brain with broken down blood brain barrier, it is the world's greatest goal achieving machine. So if you decide that you're going to have chronic Lyme forever, that's true. You will. But if you decide that, you know, you know, you're going to be healthy and this is what your life is going to look like, your brain is going to start to figure out ways to get there. That doesn't mean that you're going to get there in a day or, or three years or 12 years. You know, it depends, it depends on your situation and not everybody can heal all the way, but man, just to be able to have that hope and to start boosting the immune system and move in that direction. And on a day where you fall, you know, have your friends there. I mean, I, you know, I was recently at a, at a conference um, and, you know, I had a slip and fall. We were talking about a lot of emotional things and ways to share our stories better. And one of my friends, in fact, Joan, who wrote that book, I mean, I really, I knew her. I didn't know much about the book. And then she started talking to me and, and just supported me in a way no one had ever supported me before. And I was like, that's what friends do for each other. And that's what, you know, Darren and I are doing and everybody else in our groups is trying to support you through those hard times, but holding you accountable to a higher standard. You know, it's not going to be one of these bitch sessions. It's a place where you can go and actually get the love and the, and the and support that you need, but then also, you know, start to move in that positive direction, you know, and, you know, we're going to support you on the bad days too. So I'm, I'm pretty uh, excited. And Nicole, thanks for posting Joan's book. Um, I, I'm actually, you know, it's interesting. I talked to a couple people about this and I talked to Joan about this, but since we're public and we're live, I'm actually reaching out to contact her publisher and this is because I'm going to buy bulk. This is how important I think this book is that as soon as I get that ironed out, I'm giving it to literally every single one of my patients as a gift. That's how important it is um, from the health side, because I see everybody's going out and buying Darren's book and which probably means I got to go buy that book and give it to him too. Now that I open my mouth, but I mean it, it to me, the part that's never, that's so hard for us to support is that emotional side. You know, Darren and I are so good at what we do, but to, to be a therapist on top of it, in the office, we do our best and in the messages, but it's sometimes difficult to be able to spend all the time you really want with somebody and to give you a resource that's so helpful is really critical. Um, so. Yeah. And Tom, I should mention, if, if you're out there and you really feel like you've had a hard time, you know, finding that person to reach out to, you know, whether it's, you know, you don't really have a family member or friend you feel like you can kind of unload on. Uh, I actually work with a woman who say she's had Lyme disease since she was, I think, 18 or 20 years old. She's now in her mid 30s. She actually went back to school to get a marriage and family therapy degree, and she pretty much exclusively works with Lyme patients, and she does do awesome. it simply. So if you feel like that's a resource you want, uh, I can actually go in after and post in the comments. But uh, if you go to my website uh, and go into uh, under, uh, I think it's wellness coaching, uh, her information's there. She's in North Carolina. But uh, I've actually referred several Lyme patients to her and they've really enjoyed working with her. And I like the fact that she's very proactive. It's not just sit there for an hour and listen to you complain and go, uh-huh, that's nice. That sounds really right. horrible. You know, she's actually going to give you homework and give you some things to work on. Or I just like the way she reframes your situation in a way that helps you move forward. So if that's something that's ever interesting, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll post that link uh, after we log off. That'd be awesome. And I just posted links to um, Darren's book um, and um, to Joan's book over on Amazon. But again, you know, it goes back to what we were saying earlier. Not It's not one size fits all. And I have other people, you know, therapists local to me who do really things that do exactly what you were just talking about, Darren. But it's about figuring out what works for you and, and realizing that, you know, sometimes that doesn't work. It's it's amazing, you know, the first one or two times. And it always amazes me how many different protocols are necessary till you find like the the right one, you know. Um, and it and it's but there's there's a, a foundational piece, and I think that's what I love about your book, is it's like kind of like you get the foundational pieces of what's necessary, and then we can add all the extra stuff that that is ultra individual and necessary but we don't want to sort of miss out on the basic fundamentals. I mean, I feel like we go to some of these conferences that are talking super advanced yeah. and what you and I, but, but, and you and I are trying to get people to, you know, go back to the fundamentals of how the body functions to uplift your health and uplift your spirits. 
and then add the more intermediate and advanced stuff as necessary. But often a lot of those things aren't even necessary. <laughs> yeah. If you hit the yeah. foundation. Yeah. Well, I said, you know, I think we've both had the experience of people going out and spending a lot of money on various therapies. Again, I think they all have their place. I, again, I know we talked about like 10 pass ozone, you know, out here in California, it's 1200 to $1,500 per treatment, which for most people just becomes cost prohibitive. And again, my, uh, my, impression for most people who do it, they, they get temporary benefit at best and not long-term benefit. So, you know, right. Tom and I both have the advantage of working with a lot of Lyme patients who do a lot of different things. So I think we both have a pretty good sense about what is most likely to help you given your specific situation for the buck. And I know we're always very conscientious about your pocketbook and want you to spend your money wisely. So, um, you know, I think a lot of these, you know, fundamental things that we talked about tonight is really a great place to start. And again, a lot of it's inexpensive, I'll say relatively easy to do. And a lot of it, you do have control over how it, it kind of works out. Right on. So um, Darren, this is awesome, man. Thank you so much. We're, we're just shy of two and a half hours and it feels like we just started. No, I, I, this was great, Tom. I mean, I've been wanting to do this with you for a long time. So I'm glad we finally connected and I, I'm hoping we can get together again and do another one. I think it'd be really cool since we didn't really get into a lot of it tonight about maybe some of our Lyme treatments and maybe talk a bit more specifically about the kind of things we use, why we use them and uh, yeah. go into a little bit more depth because I know that'll be another long conversation. So uh, hopefully- Oh my God, yeah. And it's like, I've still got a couple things here that we didn't- uh... We didn't get to because and, and thank you, everybody. I mean, it's it's like we've been doing this forever. We've got a bunch of people still on. Thanks for sharing with all your support groups and friends. Remind them that, the, you know, the, the videos will be um, remain on Facebook. So you'll be able to get to them. IG doesn't keep them up too long, but we've got the recording. And then I'll certainly be um, posting this up to YouTube as well. So again, um, so Darren, um, one last thing. It's is it Darren Angles that's DarrenInglesND.com. Yep, that's my website. All right, let me throw that up because I want to make sure that that hits here. Uh, that's that, me. Yep. For a second, it didn't look right in the font. <laughs> <laughs> it does not look right. <laughs> so head over and check out Darren. Um, you know, he, he's got some really great information. And, and again, I, I mean, I, I hope that we're all able to do this uh, together again. It's super fantastic. Uh, anybody interested in seeing us, that's where we're at. Um, but follow us on Facebook um, for more of this. Follow us on Instagram. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, and, um, you know, any questions that you have for a future one, post them for us. We'll try to keep a list. Um, but, yeah, maybe we should do this sooner than later because I feel like if we ask for too many questions, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to end up writing, a, having like a video book, and then we're going to do this like 100 times, So, which would be All great. Right. I mean, any Perfect. way to share this. All right, Tom and I will look at our schedules and then we'll figure out when we can do this again soon. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for sticking with us. Um, remind all your friends they can check it out too with the replay and have a great evening. Such right. a pleasure to chat. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Aaron.